Okay, why don't we get started? Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you. Uh, this is, I guess, the the third of the symposia that we're running this semester, and the topic is genes, geometry, and development. Um, we're doing something a little different this time, although obviously the whole event is uh, via Zoom. We've actually been able to gather the speakers in one room um, with with a handful of guests. Um, so hopefully you'll get this will. Uh, well, at least the speakers will have more fun uh, talking to each other, um, uh, and maybe it'll even enliven the discussion a little bit. So let me uh, say a few things. As as usual, um, we're, we're aiming for something that's interactive, but that's hard on Zoom. So uh, all of the speakers will, in different ways, program in moments to to pause and ask for questions. If something is urgent, um, you can put it into the chat. Um, and we'll try and keep track of it. And since there are several of us in the same room, we can we can we can do the interrupting for you. Um, and uh, at the at the natural pauses, um, again, if you're comfortable putting questions in chat, that's fine. If not, um, uh, we can you know you can raise your hand and we can ask you to unmute. Um, so that's the practical stuff. We have three talks over the course of the day with. Uh, with half hour breaks so you can get up and stretch your legs. Um, and so with that, let's uh, let's get started. It's um, a particular pleasure uh, to welcome Angela DiPace from Harvard Medical School. Um, I think actually I've known Angela since she was a student at UCSF. I think that was when we first met. Mm -hmm. um, uh, her trajectory took her through Berkeley and then, and then to Harvard. Uh, she's worked uh, for many years on the complex logic of uh, uh, transcriptional regulation, particularly in, in embryonic development. Um, I would also say, and that's what you're going to hear about, um, uh, but I would also add uh, that, uh, you know, as many of us uh, struggle with uh, um, the responsibilities of mentorship, um, and uh, Angela has a fantastic record of great young people passing through her group, um, but she's also taken this, um, I, I think, much more seriously uh, as as something one can do programmatically than many of us. And I will recommend to you an, an essay that she and her young colleagues wrote uh, now several years ago about um, the construction of, of individualized mentoring plans for postdocs, um, which was really uh, quite thought provoking. Um, and so with that, um, Angela, please. Well, first of all, it's lovely to see all of you. There are the handful of people in the room here. I will first show you where we are. So here we are, now you can see we are a small quorum, but that is a delight um, being able to come to visit. So I, I appreciate the invitation, Bill. Um, and also, I, you know, in the spirit of um, collaboration, which is really the spirit of my, of my group, you will hear from me and you will also hear from two postdocs um, who have been working in my, um, in my group over the past couple of years. So we'll spend the first part of the talk um, sort of framing the question in the way that we've been approaching it over the last 10 years. And then you will hear first from Tim Hardin and then from Rosa martinez Corral, who, are, who have both done, um, in my opinion, very beautiful and insightful theoretical work on this, on this problem. So this is one of the things that we've been trying out as something to keep from the pandemic, some way in which Zoom is good. All right, so with that, um, with that spirit, we'll go ahead and get started. I will share my screen with you. And we will start slides. All right, and so I mentioned these are the three people that you will hear from today. Um, and Bill, can you just check, everybody can hear me okay? Can you get away from people? Everything sounds all right. I can see the screen because now I can see nothing except my slides. Does it look like we're yes, good to yes, go? Yes. It looks like we are good to go. Of, uh, to Give yeah. some thumbs up. So, yes, so, ah, so, silent so, hooray. So All right, perfect. All right, then let's go ahead and dig in. So I wanted to actually start my talk by thinking about these two words. And um, I often like to frame problems this way, two things that seem in tension, but are actually simultaneously true as a way of thinking about how they can be reconciled. And this is, these are the two words that describe developmental gene regulation um, to 
a set of words that can describe it, that it is simultaneously precise and yet also plastic. And so um, I just wanna spend a little bit of time sort of unpacking specifically what we mean about those two words as a way of, of, of digging in today. So the first one is to think about precision. So this is a movie of a developing Drosophila embryo. It's a really beautiful movie that was taken by Philip Keller at Jamelia Farm. And what you're watching is the first early divisions of the Drosophila embryo over the course of almost three hours. Right, and so we can um, actually watch it again if we would like to see if it will go again. There we go. So the first, the nucleus is fertilized. It divides many, many times without forming plasma membranes. Those nuclei migrate out to the surface of the embryo and they divide again in these waves. The divisions are very fast. And then there's a period of development called the blastoderm stage where the nuclei are all sitting at the periphery. Um, there are many thousands of them and they're in a single sheet. And then the plasma membranes drop in from the, the top and form a monolayer of cells. And this phase of development is actually just a transcriptional powerhouse, right? So there's a ton of transcription happening at this time because what's really going on is that the control of development is switching from being controlled by maternal gene products that were deposited in the egg to having the zy zygotic genome turned on. And so what's so cool about this particular period of development is that it's extremely accessible to not only sort of classic genetic approaches and even some biochemistry, but also quantitative imaging, which has made it really a, um, a sort of flagship system for people who are interested in using quantitative approaches and mathematical modeling to understanding the process of transcription. So there's a particular method that has gained um, enormous amounts of attention over the past few years, which is MS2 imaging, which allows you to image live transcription dynamics. And what that looks like, you'll see in the next movie, you'll see a sort of zoomed in version of it, where in the movie, you'll see uh, bright red nuclei. These are because the DNA is labeled with histones. And then you'll see um, bright green dots, um, which are actually foci of nascent transcripts. And that's because there have been viral loops engineered into the five prime end of a gene. And those loops as a transcript is made bind to a GFP labeled viral protein that recognizes the loops. So this kind of data, again, now you're watching these waves of division again, but now you can see these sites of nascent transcription popping up. And I'm always silent while I watch these kinds of movies because I just think they're so beautiful. Um, you can really understand the richness of uh, data that's available um, to interrogate the system and to think about transcription. And so when we're talking about precision in this system, you know, originally one of the ways we thought about that word was from a much more static point of view. So this is a, um, an atlas, a computationally rendered version of an average Drosophila embryo. And so this is the kind of data that I spent my postdoc and early years of my lab working with We'd used fixed stains or fixed embryos to do fluorescent staining of, of genes of RNA transcripts, and then um, image analysis and image processing to drag all of that data into a single sort of unified framework. And, um, and so what you can see from this kind of data is that there are lots of sharp transitions um, between on and off states, often that are only a single cell wide. Um, the entire system is quite reproducible in terms of how it positions itself in the embryo relatively speaking. So gene to gene relationships are quite tight. The whole system can move around a little bit. Um, and so when we were first thinking about the term precision, we were really thinking about how does it sort of get it right every time um, and how, how reproducible is it? And also how sharp are some of these responses? The way that that translates into the more stochastic um, and detailed version of gene regulation in MS2 data, you can parse that apart into many, many much more specific kinds of terms using those kinds of data. But so when we're talking about precise, this is really what we mean. We're getting things um, right every time and we're able to do it by converting very graded inputs into very sharp inputs or outputs. Okay, and we wrote um, a review, Tim is an author on, um, on this review a number of different years ago, which really goes through um, at the time what the sort of cutting edge um, thinking was about precision specifically in uh, the Drosophila system, if you're interested in taking a look. 
All right. So then what do we mean about plastic, right? So this is a picture of uh, human irises uh, that was part of a, a photography exhibit in London many, many years ago. And again, I just think these images are so spectacular. They were printed at very large size. They're from on the photographer Rankin. And you, you can see the human irises here. They look almost astronomical to me, They're like so incredible. And um, the reason why I show this slide is because I think it's a very, you know, beautiful example of human phenotypic variation, um, which in some way can be attributed to variation in gene regulation. So the way that irises become different colors is by different deposition of melanin in the eye. And the melanin biogenesis pathway has all kinds of genetic variation in it in terms of the enzymes that produce melanin when they turn on all of these different kinds of things. So some proportion of this level of human phenotypic variation is undoubtedly due to changes in, in gene regulation. So, so natural populations harbor enormous amounts of variation in their regulatory sequences. And this is just one example of a kind of phenotype, but it's true for disease phenotypes. It's true for all kinds of other phenotypes that we might be interested in as well. A natural extension of that is that that reservoir of genetic variation can be selected upon to give rise to different kinds of variation between species. And so again, this is just a very beautiful example of morphological variation between insects um, these are tree hoppers, um, and this is really beautiful work from Benjamin Prudhomme and Nicholas Gompel. Um, this, I, I'm at heart a little bit of a bug nerd, maybe not a little bit, maybe a lot of a, of a bug nerd. <laughs> and I just think these insects are incredible. The structures on their backs um, are known as helmets, and they are due to rewiring of a wing development plane. So you can just tweak the way a wing is built, and you can get something super different. Um, Any bit of cross between these things? I do not know actually much about tree hopper genetics, <laughs> but that would be it would be fascinating. I don't know how divergent they are from one another. There are probably unlikely example, likely examples like maybe the ones that both sort of look like ants. Um, so, so this is an. Ex I'm, I'm sorry. Do we know that? I mean, doing genetics on the part is in sequencing by those people. Yeah. Um, so can you pinpoint the genetic can, can, changes? Can point to the... Not to my knowledge. Um, so this is basically like the, the level at which this has been mapped to gene regulation in my, in my understanding of it is that the, the players of the wing development plan are known to be involved, but not specific evolutionary stories about changing specific regulatory elements as of yet. Um, so point being, that we need to solve a problem, which is how is it that gene regulatory sequences in development can simultaneously build the right thing every time and yet harbor so much genetic variation in natural populations that they can be selected upon to do very different things over evolutionary time. And when I was thinking about this problem as a postdoc, this was the experiment, the set of experiments that convinced me to work on this problem. Um, this is a one of a set of papers, a really, really lovely papers from um, Marty Kreitman and Misha Ludwig. Um, Nipon Patel was also involved in some of the early work, which is examining a particular regulatory sequence known as the Eve Stripe 2 enhancer and its evolution across a group of related flies. So, even skipped is a very famous gene that's expressed in the Drosophila blastoderm embryo. It's also expressed at many other times during development, um, which is very interesting in and of itself. But at the, at the blastoderm stage, it's expressed in seven stripes. And those seven stripes are due to five different enhancer sequences, which are shown as bars up at the top. And the um, Eve Strike 2 enhancer has been extremely well studied. It's if you pull it out and stick it in front of a reporter construct, um, it will drive a stripe to expression pattern. The diagram you're seeing in the middle of this slide is a really typical way for people to diagram the sequence content of, um, of enhancers, which is to map out all of the transcription factor binding sites that are known to be within it. So each bar represents a different transcription factor uh, or each color represents a different transcription factor and the height of the bar is related to the affinity of that particular binding site. 
So in Melanogaster, this is what that sequence looks like. If you look in Drosophila pseudo obscura, it looks like this. It still has, you know, lots of binding sites for many of the same factors. You can see small clusters of things that look like they're in the same place, but it is rearranged. And chimeras between these two sequences are non-functional or don't function as well, though the entire pseudo obscura sequence can substitute for the melanogaster one. Okay. So what this tells you is that the sequence itself can rearrange quite dramatically and retain its function and that there's some sort of compensatory evolution happening at the level of the sequence to help it maintain its function in the face of that kind of sequence change. Okay. So why is this, like, why does this encapsulate this problem of precision and plasticity in my mind? I am a biophysicist at heart, like a molecular biophysicist. The experiment that made me want to study that was the ATP, mitochondrial ATPase with an attached fluorescent rod to it. I love molecular machines. I want to understand how they work. This is the picture that was often shown to me about how enhancers work and how they are cooperative, which is a model of the enhancesome, which is a mammalian enhancer where different transcription factors bind to it cooperatively um, in order to turn on their target gene. But this enhancer is quite conserved in terms of its sequence. These binding sites do not move around over evolutionary time. Their affinities stay relatively the same. So this idea of how an uh, enhancer works through cooperative mechanisms of transcription factor binding, the, the story that was available when I started this work was that it really was based on sort of rigid protein-protein interactions and cooperative binding between proteins, but that's very hard to reconcile with this kind of flexible scaffold that you see for so many other developmental enhancers. So another way of talking about that problem is to think about the kinds of cartoons that people draw about what is happening in this system. So this is a very typical kind of cartoon um, that you'll find in many kinds of textbooks, which is that if we're gonna think about how Eve is expressed, if we zoom into a cell, say in stripe three, that's got Eve on, the story that we tell ourselves is that the enhancer that drives stripe three is bound to a bunch of transcription factors, which recruit a bunch of cofactors, which in turn touch polymerase. And all of that is looped up to the promoter. And this fundamentally is a story of protein recruitment, right? It's a big protein binding story. And there are lots of things that you can see in the kinds of questions that people have asked, who touches who, what are the binding affinities of all the different transcription factors, et cetera, et cetera, that sort of support the fact that this was the mental picture. Yeah. It seem from that sense, I'm not saying it's the same as the protein, but that binding map that you showed, if I looked at a sufficient outbred population or across different species, there's a covariant signal in those binding maps with different colors and the Manhattan mm -hmm. skyline, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess the question I want to ask is if one could, if some covariance signatures in that correlate or predict changes in the output that's Eve, like mm. MS2 or, or antibody, whatever your output is, and, and some aren't, and presumably the ones that do are part of this logics, this, this biophysical loop thing that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Can you actually do that kind of? Uh, that's kind of look at an ensemble of TF binding statistics, is that? So you can certainly do the covariation analysis. Mm. I think the challenge is understanding how it impacts transcriptional oh, dynamics, because there's like a, a massive disconnect in terms of the throughput of those two mm. methods, right? Mm. And so I, I think that it's possible, as an experimentalist, I would want to have a way better handle on which covariation signals we would be most interested in looking at mm. before I, told anybody to go do the experiment to measure their, their course, consequence. Course. There yeah. Were groups of made random promoter libraries. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a way of getting, you know, limited number of elements, getting saturation number of combinations. Yeah. But I'm asking to look at natural, so, so, so you know, what, yeah. what's out there. You, you, you rapidly run out of that. Yeah. No doubt about that. The number of variables, or yeah. spacing, orientation, no mod 10. No, no. Yes. So also for these problems, although they didn't do it in the old days, I mean, do people have people put aside all chromatin effects, which weren't popular in 2005, but yeah. now are very popular. People have gone back and looked, ruled that out, or 
is it always open or so i this is a what is a wonderful question i think the and actually i think by the end of our talk we'll have more language to talk about it potentially yeah. Yeah. but yeah. but but point being that i think the desire for chromatin to be upstream of this process as a simplifying assumption was extremely strong right so the idea that things were op like you opened them up and then they were open for business and then you didn't have to worry about it as a as a sort of another mechanistic piece um was a simplifying assumption for a long time that i think we're running up against the limits of um okay so where does the theory come in so you know i approached this problem as um somebody who came sort of more from the protein structure world and I used to work on yeast prions, so I worked on one protein in a single-celled organism. And when I started thinking about working on many, many proteins in a multicellular organism, one of the things that struck me was how difficult it was to have a sort of ground truth expectation for which you could gauge your experiments, right? So if like, how do you, how do you decide what's surprising and what's not surprising? And this is really the role that models have played in our work. And this is a, a wonderful quote that was shared with me by my collaborator, Jeremy Goodwardna, where he says, models in analytical pharmacology are not meant to be descriptions, pathetic descriptions of nature. They are designed to be accurate descriptions of our pathetic thinking about nature. Just substitute systems biology for analytical pharmacology and you have it. So really they are a thinking tool for us. They're a way of making our assumptions explicit and sort of turning the, the crank of the model to see what we should expect and, and hoping that that's a common language for us to anchor our conversations with other people. Um, our work has gone through a number of different parts of this cartoon, which I'll just highlight for you. Um, we've worked a lot on the problem of transcription factor function. So what do the TFs in this system actually do? Um, we've worked a lot on this idea of how, what does this, what is this aggregate in the middle? What are the sources of cooperativity in there? And that has been a really wonderful collaboration with Jeremy um, in two papers over the last, um, you know, several years, which I will not talk about today. Um, We've talked about, we thought about the limits of modularity. So this idea that there are multiple enhancers driving expression of a gene, but that they somehow don't interact with each other, that they can all be thought of as sort of separate pieces. Um, and we've worked on, on that problem. Um, and that was really led in the early days by Ziba Wunderlich, who now has her own lab at Boston University. And Clarissa Scholes, whose work, um, who's a graduate student with me, and you will um, see the theory work that she did in trying to understand this question of modularity actually ended up being the basis for the work on um, kinetic synergy that we'll talk about today. And then the last is this, this concept of kinetic synergy, actually. So let's, let's go back one. There we go. Okay, so this, this concept, which is what we'll spend the bulk of the talk on today, is really a, a different idea about how transcription factors might work together. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not based on their physical interactions, but is instead based on what kinds of kinetic functions they have, right? So how do they work together on a shared process? Not necessarily how do they drag each other down um, onto the DNA. And uh, you'll hear both from Tim and Rosa who have really led, um, led this project. So as I mentioned, this project was actually born from this uh, question that Clarissa had which is if two enhancers are both driving expression of the same target gene, and sometimes they even do that in the same cells, how do they do that? How do we think about that problem? And everyone in the entire world told us that we should do this experiment to try to understand that problem, which is, so there are two enhancers that drive expression of the same gene in the same cells. Make reporter constructs that have both enhancers, one enhancer or the other enhancer, and then see how they combine. And when you do that, you will know whether or not they are additive, multiplicative, or averaged. And I was like, that is great. I can make that measurement. But what will that tell me about how they work together, whether they are additive, multiplicative, or averaged? What does that actually tell me about the molecular mechanism underneath? And that was where it got really muddy. There was no strong null hypothesis for what actually the adding together meant. As we thought about it more, we realized that um, this was actually analogous mathematically to a simpler problem, which is how do two activators together work on the same promoter, right? So if you think of an enhancer as just an activating unit and you have two of them, how do they operate on the same promoter? 
And so there was a, a, a model for looking at that. And uh, I learned about it from Rob Phillips. Um, and I think this quote from him is a sort of nice place to start where our, our work on that um, of sort of deeply interrogating that model, which was, he says, often in cell biology, when theoretical modeling takes place, it is as a figure seven reflection on experiments that have already been done with data fitting, providing a metric of success. Figure one theory by way of contrast is about living dangerously by turning our thinking into formal mathematical predictions and confronting that math with experiments that have not yet been done. So we took heart in that idea that we should do some theory before we did any experiments to say that we would be able to interpret our results. And so Clarissa started with this kind of, thinking about this kind of model, which is really a thermodynamic state ensemble model um, based on statistical mechanics. It was first used in the 70s um, for thinking about bacterial gene regulation, and it's been updated for animal systems and used quite widely, actually. As we looked at this model, um, of which you know we have also used it in, in various times, we realized it, it suffered from one very big limitation for our question about how activators work together, which is that it effectively only has the ability to contend with one rate limiting step in transcription. And that's often th thought about as recruitment of polymerase to the promoter, um, but there are lots of regulated steps in transcription, both bacterial transcription and animal transcription. So these are two diagrams um, of prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcriptional cycles. And Eric, this goes back to your question about chromatin modification and the way that that's been sort of incorporated into the cycle in a lot of these conceptual diagrams, which is as an upstream step, but then there's lots of action sort of at the level of assembly of large macromolecular complexes. So we were quite interested in asking just a very simple question, which is what happens if you think about transcription as a cycle and thinking about it from um, a, you know, a kinetic point of view. And we were not the first people to think about this idea. This is a really wonderful paper from Herschelag and Johnson in 93, where they talk about this idea very explicitly, um, kinetic synergy. So our contribution here was translating this kind of idea into stochastic chemical kinetics, which we did with Al Sanchez when he was a fellow at Roland, he's now at, at Yale. And, you know, roughly speaking, we wrote down a generic transcription cycle. We set a kinetic rate matrix, we solved it and we looked at the output. This is, you know, nothing, nothing fancy, but, and the intuition from it, I think, and again, it was, it was very simple. We asked sort of how two different transcription factors A and B could work on such a two-step cycle. And the intuition from this model was um, was really pretty easy. There were a few things that we were sort of surprised by how, how well it did. The first thing was that you could recapitulate all the different logic gates using just this kind of um, two-step system. And you know, one of the reasons why we were excited about that is because this paper from Terry Bois was really influential in saying that these kinds of thermodynamic state ensemble models were powerful because you could use them as a way of understanding how to build lots of different kinds of bacterial gene regulation circuits. But you can also do the same thing with a kinetic model, which is what Clarissa and Al showed. And then also that, you know, this is the kind of thing that you do on the on a napkin in the break room to see if you've got an idea worth pursuing because it actually didn't require doing any of the theory we sort of figured it out, which is that you can build an AND gate in a really you know, world's simplest way, right? If there are two regulated steps, you have one component, but the other one is still limiting. You have the other component, the other one's still limiting, but you have both now you've got an AND gate, right? Like, so the, the, the idea here was it, how much sort of information processing capability is there in a kinetic system like this? The thing that was required in Clarissa's theory for kinetic synergy to work was surprisingly not that the two transcription factors had mutually exclusive functions on different steps. They just needed to work on the different steps to different extents. And even then you could get, um, you could get them to, to sort of perform cool in information processing tasks. And so that was really where we started this um, sort of second phase of this project of asking whether or not kinetic synergy is sort of feasible in, um, in this Drosophila developmental system. 
And so what you'll see are, are two different approaches to that problem. Um, one using an endogenous enhancer element that we modified to ask about how you know, real transcription factors work um, kinetically. And Tim will tell you about that project. And another one where we used a very synthetic system with a single binding site and then competed two different transcription factors on it to see if we could also see some kinetic signature between how they might interact and using a different kind of um, analytical um, theory to contextualize that work. And Rosa will tell you about that. So with that, I am going to stop my own share and invite Tim to share his slides. Oh, look at that. Here he is. Uh, can you see my cursor, Angela? Okay, cool. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, so with kinetic okay. synergy in mind. And we oh, there was a suggestion that we pause and see if there are questions before you get started. Okay, I only ask that if there are questions within your room, Angela, maybe you restate the questions before you answer them. Will do. I had a kind of. You think about the, the thermodynamic models that you're pointing to, they typically imagine like in, 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 the, in the structure of the, um, of the enhanced zone that interactions are direct. Correct. So, right, there are. There are two models for, if you think about interacting binding sites, right? There are two very different models for aliphatic. Mm -hmm. um, in proteins, there's ones in which the binding events interact directly, and there's others in which they, the interaction is mediated by some other confirmation of the gene sequence. Mm -hmm. um, so the more we know about, uh, the, the, the more molecules that seem to be finding their way into the neighborhood of active transcriptional sites, doesn't it seem like something more like a, a monoline Michelangelo picture where you have some collective degrees of freedom that are influenced by the binding events and thus mediate the cooperativity um, even between things which can't directly interact with each other? And I, I mean, maybe the answer is sure, but it doesn't matter for anything you're going to say, but I just thought <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ask it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was if um, the thermodynamic models that, I will, I will restate it. I oversimplified how rigid they are, but that they could actually accommodate more indirect modes of protein protein interactions through different kinds of al allosteric, allosteric interactions, correct? So this sort of, there might be a more general statement about. Um, Mono and Shanzhou kind of models that could accommodate a much larger molecular complexity in that kind of framework. Is that a fair restatement? Yeah. Okay. So I completely agree that that's true. I think that the um, the question that we had in this particular case is in some ways just a practical one, right? The the kinetic models that we're showing are in no way. I, th I would actually think of them as sort of an, an, an add-on to that kind of framework, right? And then also you could have multiple regulated steps, right? Um, the work with Jeremy, I think, is more in the wheelhouse of this question of what the sort of collective cooperativity properties of the ensemble might be. The question that we had here was, and specifically that we're trying to address with the question of kinetic synergy, is in some ways almost like a, a practical question of what to do with TFs, right? So how do we think about which ones you need in order to build an active regulatory element? And might it be that there is some practical map between which kinetic roles they have, regardless of who they interact with in order to do it, and the different, um, and the sort of combinatorial control required to turn on a gene? And so I think that I think that both those things can sort of live alongside one another. There's also the remark that from, that from John Whittem ages ago in yeast that uh, transcription factors will it requires the cooperativity just by having displaced uh, a common nucleosome. Correct. And that's 
Yeah. So the, the to restate that question, there is some degree of cooperativity that occurs um, just from displacing a nucleosome. So I would actually say that in some ways that's you know, related to a concept of kinetic synergy because you're sort of operating on a shared process, right? I've got to clear things out in order to do the work. And so the shared process there is clearing a nucleosome. Um, but there is also potentially a, a broader sort of shared process that might be useful to draw a box around. Any other questions before we keep going? Bill, do you see any? Okay. All right, Tim, take it away. Okay. Um, so we tried to design some experiments um, to measure um, the roles of individual transcription factors, uh, specifically how much those roles overlapped, um, but not in the sense that, you know, looking at this cartoon, not in the sense of, you know, what happens when A and B are present, but taking a step back and saying what happens when A is present to the regulation of the transcription cycle, and then maybe what happens when B is present, and then, um, and then we can learn something about how they interact um, from that more simplified view. And to do that, I designed um, experiments with the MS2 technology that Angela talked about earlier. Um, and so that's, you know, some bit of regulatory DNA, enhanced motor, um, some reporter gene that encodes our, um, our MS2 in the RNA. And then as the polymerases march along their cognate gene, um, the nascent RNA is, is, is tagged fluorescently and you get some kind of picture of that you know, on the individual nuclei level, which is, you know, RNA and, or DNA, excuse me, in magenta, and then our transcription signal in green. Um, and so with MS2, we don't have access to any of the molecular details um, of the system. Um, and this really comes down to the crux about how we uh, approach, you know, the modeling um, uh, of this whole, uh, of this whole project. So in, in practice, this means that we really could only measure the kinetics of transcription signals, um, which is very different from measuring the kinetics of, you know, their underlying biochemical transitions. Um, and so from, you know, from each one of these nuclei that, that we measure transcription in, we can convert that into a transcription record, which I've shown here. Um, and then from this record, we can, you know, say measure from the start of the nuclear cycle or the start of the blastoderm phase, you know, how long does it take for transcription to turn on uh, within this particular nucleus? Um, and then, um, you know, similarly, we can measure, you know, once transcription turns on for some interval, how long does it take to turn off uh, and vice versa, you know, once it's turned off, how long? And so from this, we can pull out these, this, these kinetics of signals, um, which you know map in some way to the underlying biochemistry, but not at all uh, in a way that we understand. But but then the idea is to look at okay, if we change uh, the activity of transcription factors, how does how do the kinetics of these signals change? Um, so to start, we chose you know three uh, transcriptional factors um, that are that are active in the blastoderm. Zelda is a pioneer factor. If you're um, in transcription, those are kind of popular right now. You know, these pioneer factors are thought to be able to bind to close chromatin. Um, and, you know, whereas maybe other transcription factors can't, um, and then maybe open it up for business or downstream regulation. Um, we also chose bicoid, which of course um, is known for its uh, concentration gradient and its regulation of the gap genes, including hunchback. Um, and then a lesser known activator called, uh, called STAT, which, you know, has homologs in, in all the higher organisms as well. Um, and then here's a cartoon of um, our experimental constructs. And so we have um, our regulatory DNA consists of uh, the enhancer for that, um, the, the second strike of Eve that Angela mentioned earlier. Uh, it's cognate promoter, it's driving the MS2 reporter. Um, and in between it's separated, but by what I'm calling a wild type spacer sequence, which is, um, which is the, the sequence that separates the enhancer and the promoter in the endogenous Eve locus. And so here it's important to point out that if you look at 
um, any bit of genetic DNA, but particularly regulatory DNA, you know, the bits around promoters and enhancers, they're just chock full of transcription factor binding sites. You already saw examples of that. Um, and, um, and so because of that, uh, we wanted to be able to, um, because there's, there's a lot of binding sites in this uh, for other uh, transcription factors in this spacer sequence, we wanted to try and isolate the activity of eavesdrive too, um, which is this, you know, as best as we can say, it's um, or it's one of the best characterized enhancers around. Um, and so we, you know, to, to strip away all the complexity, what we ended up doing was designing a, um, a synthetic sequence that was computationally designed to lack binding sites for any um, transcription factors that are present in the blastoderm. Right, and then from this more um, uh, stripped down version um, of the Steve promoter, we then added back in, um, you know, transcription factor activity to test um, the role of the different transcription factors. So that just is, you know, pretty simple. We just added two uh, binding sites um, for, you know, whatever um, our transcription factor was. So we had one for SOVA, Bitcoin, and DSTAT. And so together we get five experimental conditions or three experimental conditions rather for one for each transcription factor. We have this control that I'm calling neutral um, that we can make all of our direct comparisons to um, because the sequences are identical say for these you know, few binding sites. Um, and then we have this other pseudo control, this wild type thing that it's hard to make direct comparisons to that because um, you know, the, the spacer sequence is, is so different, um, but it actually serves as kind of this upper bounds kind of useful marker um, of transcription in the system. So the most stupid, simple way um, that we can kind of show um, a first pass at our data is just to look at um, the number of nuclei that are actively transcribing um, at each point in time across the blastoderm. Uh, and I'm showing this for um, for our neutral um, construct. Um, and all we do here is, you know, here's, here's a, a zoom in on our field of view, actually a little bit bigger than that. But um, uh, we count all the nuclei that are, that just have spots associated with them uh, at each time point. And then we just plot that number over time. And, and for neutral, you can see it, it starts very late, it's like 20 minutes in the blastoderm. And at any given time, it's only expressing a small number of nuclei. And then you contrast that with our wild type uh, construct. Um, and you immediately see that, that these two things are, are very different. And uh, the wild type construct, you know, earlier um, in the blast are far more number of nuclei are, are expressing at any given time. Um, and this is really- Tim, Tim you're always the... so calm when you present like this contrast. And this was like the first piece of data. I found, I found it very upsetting to be honest. Like, because it just says that like this whole picture of very modular enhancers that we can pull out of their context and that they do roughly, you know, similar things is just much more touchy than you, you would imagine, right? Like this, this is supposedly a bunch of regulatory DNA that's like not supposed to really be doing anything, but it has, it has fairly dramatic effects on the dynamics of transcription, even though the, the little weak stripe two is a reasonable stripe two. So, so I this would be something that's worth talking about in some in some depth because I think some of the other work that we've done has shown that without that really minimal context, the impact of any mutation or or change that you're making in an endogenous peach is much lower. It's just a much more buffered system. So the the weak, small, neutral thing turns out to be a really important way of getting the signal low enough that we can see anything by adding transcription factor by anything. Could it be that the elasticity gap and mechanics of that piece of DNA matter? Because I mean, we may have aggregated the transcription factor binding, but we know that there are mechanical consequences of nuclear anyway, right? So it absolutely could be. So that it could be as non-specific an effect as that, if that's what I call it. It could be, right? I mean, that neutral piece of DNA is designed basically to cull out predicted binding sites with sort of minimum mutations. So it's not like 
a super weird piece of DNA, um, but yeah. it's, you know, I think getting to those properties would be, would be experimentally a challenge, but mm -hmm. I just, I, this was one of the more surprising when, when Tim came with this sort of simple result, which we really thought was just, again, there's lots of interesting stuff just in the controls. It shows that the, the landscape itself might be. But there's so many variables involved in how you put down those two sliding spikes. Placing and spacing but this doesn't have any added binding sites. This is just two, this is just the Eve Stripe 2 minimal enhancer, either with the native sequence to the promoter or a neutrally designed spacer to the promoter. That's it. We haven't added any binding sites at all. So that's why I thought it was it was surprising. And if you use the I realize you're measuring the nascent MRA, right? Mm -hmm. Using MSC, but um, is the when you when you put the wild type sequence back uh, that was recorded on set, is the strike as precise as it is in the in the type of your cycle? When you put the wild type sequence, because what you're, show, what you're yeah. showing here is that if I take something that I thought wasn't important, yeah, and 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 fiddle with it, I have this dramatic effect. Yeah. But and you're describing the thing you're calling wild type is still a construct. Right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so the question is, is it right, so? So how does are they compare, in the, Yeah. Like how does it compare with the real structure? Yeah. 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 No. It's and the answer is like. Even, different even again, right? Okay. By small amounts. Yeah. So I think the um, we've seen that again and again with as you pull as you pull reporter constructs of any type out, you lose some fidelity of some of some type. Um, this, um, but I think the point that for this one was that these sort of weakened weakened systems can be very useful for then being able to do addbacks or sort of mutational analyses that would be actually really hard to see in the endogenous system. Sorry, Tim, I totally interrupted you. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, uh, so there, there were a, a couple of questions in the chat box as well. Um, one was on, on bursting uh, and I said, we'd get back to that. Um, and the other one was on, <laughs> Why is the neutral sequence not the exact same length as the wild type sequence? Um, and that's that's a great question as well. Um, and the you know the idea is just kind of the um, the difficulty of, of designing uh, and cloning these sequences. And we just wanted to get something away from uh, from the promoter. Um, we wanted to get the enhancer away from the promoter um, because we know you shove the enhancer right up against it. Um, it uh, you know the uh, binding sites themselves, as well as enhancers, just act kind of funny. Um, and there's so, a practical trade off between the longer a neutral spacer you make, the weirder the sequence becomes because it starts becoming repetitive and like harder to work with and harder to clone. So there's a sort of practical limit for how big you can make them without being introducing something else strange. Um, and so I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if this uh, if this came across in the room or something. But but anyways, what we're getting at is is these two um, this result, which yeah, I wasn't uh, as surprised about. I was kind of naive going into it um, as, as Angela was, but uh, it it provides a really nice context where we have this big dynamic range where as we add activity to the neutral condition, um, or you know, for any given transcription factor. Um, you know, it's it's not near uh, saturation of expression, so we, we can really see kind of fine changes. Um, and so the the result that actually really shocked me uh, and locked me, and you know, made me pot committed to this project was was this one when we um, oops, when we added or looked at the Zelda sites, right? Um, and here's the, the plot, which is, is really striking. But I didn't need a plot to look at this; I just kind of looked at it in the microscope. Um, and you just saw these spots, which which really um, took me back. Because all we did is, you know, add a couple of binding sites, and there's binding sites all over the place in this enhancer. And this is just a few, you know, eight nucleotides each that that we mutated, and we we've transformed this really poorly expressing thing um, into something um, close to this really robustly expressing thing, right? 
Um, and then when we, we looked at the picoid um, construct, uh, yeah, that, that um, effect was a little bit more mild, but that's kind of to be expected as there's other picoid binding sites in the EVE2 enhancers. So, um, so maybe picoid activity is, is kind of already close to saturation there. And then Question. that. Uh, Question. Yeah. Yeah, so I was wondering uh, if we go back to the Zelda uh, case, right, where you added to Zelda sites. So sure. I'd assume that would, uh, being a pioneering factor, that would like uh, keep the chromatin more open for business in general. So I was wondering, uh, given, I mean, here, of course, you are showing the number of uh, the fraction of active nuclei. As your previous slides, you also showed that uh, so called active nucleus might not be active all the time, right? Because the mRNA signal was fluctuating. So I was wondering, like in case of Zelda, uh, how does the fluctuation compare in case, uh, you know, in comparison to the wild type? I mean, um, uh, is the mRNA production rate the same for like the average number of nuclei or like, is it a little lower but more consistent over longer time or what? Yeah, so we uh, will address that exact. Well, yeah, we don't go in detail in that model, but we, we do look at that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think you're, you're asking, you know, once a nucleus turns on, um, you know, how long does it stay on or how frequently does it come on or off? Um, is that? Are you, you kind know, of that. So I'm, because I'm wondering that with Zelda, you are probably leaving those, uh, you know, that enhancer sequence more open for business, right? So once it's more open for business, would, would it just be doing business as usual or, uh, you know, it would still be on, but not as, uh, uh, you, you know, as, as uh, do as well as the wild type or what? Because I just see the fraction. I don't know how each of the participating nuclei, uh, how strongly they're expressing, right? So that's what I'm wondering about. So you, there, are, I think you'll you'll get part way to your satisfying answer in the next chunk of Tim's talk when we move past just okay. active nuclei to a more a more detailed analysis. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and you know, we'll, we'll see how how satisfying it is. You know, you. you you kind of talked about like this idea that the enhancer is more open and um, and things like that. And you know, I just like I'm I'm not really convinced of, of any of these um, you know fantastical models that that we have in our head about that. Uh, this kind of goes back to Angela's um, Angela's idea that you know these models are you know kind of representations of our our inadequate thinking around these things. So. Um, so, so maybe, but you know, it's 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 hard to say from our just you know, MS two isn't that great of an experiment. It doesn't tell us that much about uh, the details um, of what's going on at the locus for us to really, really talk about um, things on the molecular level. Um, but, but yeah, so you know, we we saw these things, uh, but the idea was that we, we wanted just some way to um, to to make these qualitative observations quantitative, right? Um, and so returned back to these um, transcription records that I showed you up earlier. And now I've chopped it up into regions um, and basically, um, you know, uh, and, then, and then colored these regions appropriately. And then, you know, from this kind of staring at transcription records and, um, and, and you know, this is just one from one experiment, but for every experiment, we get hundreds of these, right? And so um, from these, then, you know, we came up with just, again, you know, some kind of, you know, call it, call it a representation of our pathetic thinking, but some model um, that we thought uh, would allow us to quantify this trace, right? And, and, and get some kind of um, idea of, of, uh, of how to compare the changes that every transcription factor uh, introduces to the transcription profile. Um, and so the model goes something like, you know, each nucleus starts in some not expressing state I call closed, and its first decision point is to whether to ever open up over the, the course of the blastoderm. So some just never express, um, and others, you know, will choose to turn on. Uh, and then how long does it take them to go from this closed state to the active state? So this is this, you know, arrow, arrow, dot, dot, dot kind of representation of, of this time. And then once it's in the active time, yeah, you know, so I've, I've colored this in teach and then 
once it's in the, the active state, it can bounce between you know an idle state where we don't detect transcription and an active state where we do detect, detect transcription. Um, and that's you know bouncing between the purple and the blue. And you know again, it's just hard to take this model too seriously, um, but it is you know kind of useful for for how we're thinking about it. Um, so Jim, I want to actually pause here to sort of emphasize the philosophy of your approach here compared to something that's more molecularly detailed, right? So this is totally an example of like figure seven theory, right? It's like super data driven. There, we've got a bunch of distributions of a bunch of different parameters, like or things that we can pull out of this data now, right? And none of them are normally distributed, right? And so the question is, is there sort of a phenomenological model that we can write down that helps us rigorously compare what those distributions look like and assign it roughly speaking to some piece of this simplified model. That's it, right? Like that's we're not like in, in no way are we trying to abstract real biochemistry here. We're just asking given these kinds of transitions in a very crude kinetic model, if we look at all these non-normally distributed uh, distributions of our different constructs, can we assign a sort of crude answer of who's operating where and are they distinct from each other? So, yeah. So even when you have multiple estimates and then trying to keep them separate, can you build a new or like any type of distribution that, you know, that anything like you know, a double set or as a function of type or certain way of changes in that way you're trying to keep them or is it something like that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll let Tim answer exactly how deeply non-normal they all look, but that's my impression. Um, and the, um, Tim, are they all deeply non-normal? Oh, well, I mean, they all have peaks, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, they're... Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so they're all deeply non-normal. <laughs> so that's the answer. And Tim, I also want to make sure, so we've got till 1230, and we want to make sure that Rosa's... Um, Oh gotcha. boy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going. We're going slow. The Zoom vortex has been deep today. <laughs> okay. Right. So so I'm only going to talk about you know these these times in teach, and this is what we're calling the first passage time, uh, and then our model that we apply uh, to those particular kinetics, and then um, but we do the same thing for the rest of the kinetics, um, but I don't go in as much detail about that. Um, but here's the the cumulative distributions of these. Um, of these models so you know you'll get to see um in just a moment or yeah i mean they're not normally distributed but this is the, this plot is very similar to what i was showing you before about you know kind of number of spots uh first time but now it's they're they're cumulative so every time a nuclei turns on each one of these curves 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 ticks up and then um if they turn off they don't tick down right so these curves are monotonically increasing and all we wanted was some model to uh, to make this plot, um, you know, quantitative, right? It, it's exactly what you would think is that the wild or the neutral um, is kind of a, a poor enhancer, and the wild type is a strong enhancer, and the transcription factor um, constructs are somewhere in between. But how do we how do we quantify this? Uh, so we just came up with, you know, something that a lot of other people have used in biology, and that's just um, the gamma distribution, right? And that's, um, so that's just a series of stochastic steps um, that lead to, you know, in this case, first passage transcription. And so um, from that, you can, you know, pull out three different um, parameters, you know, the active fraction of nuclear, you know, and then we can find these parameters, you know, biological uh, relevancy, you know, how much you buy into that is, is up to you, but we have an, an active fraction of nuclei. Um, and so that's, you know, the number, this, this first decision point, and then you have some, some rate constant, time constant associated with the, uh, uh, the time of each rate limiting step. And then you have the number of rate limiting steps in the speech box, right? Um, and, you know, as you can see them, you know, the distribution, you know, fall or the, the model, you know, maps to the, the experimental data, good enough for, um, for what we're looking at. Um, and then you can pull out the, um, the actual, you know, parameters that you get. And we globally fit one parameter to cut down on the number of parameters. So we said, you know, the time constant for all the steps was the same. 
and then let the others float. And just as you would expect, um, you know, the the active fraction can almost be read just right off the, the plot. So we don't need to go into that. But then um, the number of rate limiting steps parameter or whatever that is, you cannot just simply read right off the plot. So the model becomes pretty useful. And, you know, of course, Zelda and wild type have a similar value for this parameter. Bitcoin and DSTAT have some greater um, parameter or value for this parameter. Um, but all we can really do, because we don't know the, the basal activity of each one of these TFs, um, all we can really do is compare these back to our neutral result. Um, so, you know, we're kind of forced to conclude that each one of these transcription factors increases the active fraction of nuclei, decreases this other parameter, you know, we're calling the number of rate limiting steps, and all of that leads to more transcription. Um, the model looks something like this, and you might conclude, okay, all transcription factors are the same. Um, they all work on these steps. Um, and, you know, that's a bit unsatisfying because we came into this suspecting that, you know, trans transcriptional activators might be different. But of course, we weren't done there. We applied similar phenomenological models to um, the active transcription times. Um, here are those distributions um, plotted as uh, survival curves. Um, you know, fit them to a two-step exponential model, uh, and then something similar for the distribution of idle times. Um, and we're left with a final model that looks like this, um, wherein um, all TFs act on some steps, uh, while only one or two act on others. Um, and the activity of all these TFs changes over time, um, which, you know, is so very reasonable because the, the the context of the of the nuclei are changing over time as chromatin marks um, are being removed and new ones are being laid down. Um, the concentration of you know different proteins is changing over this time, um, but at the same time it's you know it's it's pretty surprising. Um, you know, Zell is a good example where early on it speeds up the transition from the idle state to the active state, um, which leads to more transcription. Whereas later on, um, it actually oops, uh, it actually uh, inhibits this transition, which leads to less uh, fewer transcription. So Zelda, you know, has kind of this activating um, function, you know, early on in the nuclear cycle, and then it switches later on in the nuclear cycle to actually lead to less transcription. Um, and so, uh, you know, this this work, I think, it does have a number of interesting themes, you know. As far as biologically goes, like evolutionarily, um, it kind of speaks to why do different G TFs regulate different genes, you know, and, and um, evolution might care um, not only about a TF being present in the same cell at the same time uh, as its target gene, but it might also care about the kinetics of how its target gene is expressed. Um, and it has a number of activators to choose. Um, to, to really fine tune the kinetics. Uh, and then it just shows. Tim, I'm you know, gonna that, I'm gonna jump in right there and because I think we've we're gonna moving we on. To, yeah, okay. we just need to we just need to make sure that we're we're moving on so that we can hear from Rosa. Um but so Rosa, well you're but thank you. Like <laughs> thank you for um and Tim will be here the whole time for more questions too if people have more questions at the end. Um Rosa, while you're getting ready to share your screen. I'll just make a couple of, um, of quick comments while she gets started, which again, like the goal here for us was to take data that's quite noisy and do the simplest possible thing with it to just ask this question about whether or not we could see something distinguishable between the different TFs. Like, can they play different kinetic roles? You could certainly do much more complicated things than what we did with that, with that data. But I think it got us to the question that we were interested in, which is, yes, these activators are distinguishable from one another. They are distinguishable by MS2 data. And that might give us a way into thinking about the sort of evolutionary plasticity problem, right? Maybe, they, um, maybe they're actually just play, doing, di doing different jobs. Um, and that's part of how we get different, um, uh, different TFs there. All right, Rosa, are you ready to go? Uh, yes, do you see the screen properly? Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so now that um, 
you've seen that TS can do different things. Um, I want to go back to this idea of kinetic synergy, which Angela introduced before, which uh, simplifying uh, a lot, if we have two transcription factors, each of which acts on a different transition, then this idea um, suggests that when the two TS are present together, expression is much higher than when each of them is present um, individually. And we call this kinetic synergy because it's coming from this kinetic effect on the transcription cycle. And so we wanted to uh, reason more rigorously about the principles that govern the emergence of this kinetic synergy. And the problem here is that if we focus on a natural scenario which, where each TF binds to its own site, then it's quite, tough, quite hard to distinguish what the effects might be that are coming from these kinetic interactions from the effects coming from recruitment or even allosteric processes where TFs affect each other's binding on the DNA. So to circumvent this limitation, we have been focusing on a synthetic approach where we um, have only one binding site where two TFs bind. So the idea here is that at any given time, only one of the TFs should be specifically bound, but because TFs bind and unbind quickly, over time, both of them should be able to bind and therefore have an effect. Moreover, this uh, synthetic scenario is also convenient in terms of uh, the fact that we can then interrogate it both theoretically and experimentally. Experimentally, if you're wondering how, how we can build this, so this is done in, by the experimentalists in the DePace lab and in collaboration with the uh, group of Mokali, so I did not do the experiments. But the idea is that we can build these synthetic TFs where we have the activation domain of a transcription factor of interest that's fused to a DNA binding domain composed of engineered zinc fingers that are designed to bind to a specific site on the DNA that doesn't exist in the native genome. And so the idea is that we can fuse this same DNA binding domain to different activation domains to assay the role of different transcription factors. And so we can uh, put this uh, binding site upstream of a reporter. This is integrated into uh, the genome of a mammalian cell line and so the effect of the TFs can be measured by looking at uh, fluorescence, for example, with flow site geometry. So we have this system where two TFs bind uh, to the same site. And so the question is, what kind of behavior should we expect? And what, what should be um, the factors that affect the synergy that the two TFs can, uh, can generate? So is it only the effects that they have on the transcription cycle? Or is there other factors as well that are important when we consider how much synergy two TFs can generate. So to answer these kinds of questions, uh, we built a mathematical model. And this mathematical model can be thought of having two parts. So on the one hand, we model the binding and the unbinding of the TFs to the single site. So you see here the binding site, which can be either empty, bound by one TF, or bound by the other TF. On the other hand, we have the transcription cycle, which we simplify into very simple cycle, only three states. You can think of it as, for example, the transcription cycle is em uh, the transcription start site is empty, or polymerase is bound, or polymerase is actively transcribing. And we assume that mRNA is produced when the system transitions from state three to state one. Now the question is, how do we introduce the effect of the TFs on the progression of the cycle? And for this, um, we um, assume that whenever a TF is bound, the cycle can progress differently than when the TF is not bound. So we can uh, model this by assuming that we have this uh, transcription cycle occurring either in the absence of the TF or when one or the other TF is present. And we are assuming that whenever the TF is bound, the rates of the cycle can be different than when it is not bound. So for example, if we want to represent that A um, accelerates the first transition, we uh, would encode this by assuming that this K1 a parameter is larger than the basal one. So of course, this is uh, highly simplified because we know that TFs can recruit cofactors that perhaps remain bound even if the TF is not no longer bound. And this certainly is some detail that we could incorporate, but we think that for um, generating intuition about how this system might work, this is a, a, good, a, a good enough approximation for thinking about it. So what we want to do with this model is not to fit data, but instead to interrogate what kinds of behaviors this uh, model can generate. And so for this, we are going to look at the steady state behavior of the system as a function of the parameter values and try to understand um, what different behaviors emerge when we make different assumptions on how the transcription factors 
act. But before we can do this, uh, we need to find a measure of synergy that's appropriate for this kind of scenario. And for this, we propose the following measure. So we propose to compare the expression when the two TFs are present um, together, each at the same concentration, to the expression that, that each of the TF uh, produces when it is uh, present alone, but to twice as much the concentration as when it is present in combination. So the idea is TF concentration is always fixed, but in one case, it's contributed by what type of molecules. In the other case, it's contributed by two types of molecules. And the idea is if A is the strongest of the TS, so when it is alone, it produces more expression than B. Now we replace half of the molecules of A by molecules of B, and we see that expression increases. This is an indication of synergy. But what's uh, interesting is that we may also want to um, interrogate uh, maybe not so clear behaviors, or we may want to understand how different um, um, behaviors are generated in a continuous manner. So what we decided to do is um, take uh, the ratio of uh, combined expression to individual expression, and then take the log two logarithm, and then quantify synergy as a point in a two-dimensional space that's um, defined by these two uh, quantities. And so um, if we always consider that A is the strongest of the TFs, this gives us a characterization of the behavior of any pair of TFs as a point in this two-dimensional space. Um, which can fall into three different quadrants. So on the one hand, we have uh, the positive synergy quadrant where expression is stronger in the combination. And this is really the true positive synergy that we have been discussing so far, but we can also characterize negative synergy if expression is weaker or asymmetric synergy if expression is in between. So just to give you, um, and as I said, because A is the strongest of the TF, this quadrant is left no. So just to give you an example, if this is the pattern of expressions that we get from either the model or from the data, um, we take um, the ratio of six over three to the base two logarithm is one that gives us this x-axis value. And then we take six over two, three base two logarithm, it's like 1.6, we get this value. So that's how we quantify synergy. So now the question is, what kinds of behaviors the model can produce? under different assumptions for how the TFs act on the transcription cycle. So as a sanity check, we started um, with this uh, situation where the two TFs act on the same transition. And the idea here is that in principle, we should not see the emergence of synergy in this case. And to, to verify this, what we did is to um, explore numerically the behavior of the, of the model. So basically we sample parameters. We use an algorithm that allows us to explore the behavior of the model as a function of the parameters, such that iteratively, we try to occupy as much as possible of the space in the synergy, in the synergy diagram that I showed you before. And when we do this for this um, scenario, we see that the model can occupy points inside this region that's delimited by the black line, which is the boundary for the model. And what this means is that under the assumptions for parameter values that are are always like, uh, I need to define them to be within certain ranges, but under those assumptions and under the assumption that the two TFs act on this first transition, this is the types of behaviors that we could explain. So only asymmetric synergy, which is what we would expect, so all good. Now, what happens if we go to the um, other situation that we explained before, where each TF has a completely different effect? In this case, what we see is that a lot of positive synergy can emerge, Although in some cases we would we would also get um, asymmetric signals. And finally, if we go to the more probably realistic scenario where TFs have partially overlapping activities, we see that still a lot of positive synergy can emerge, but also a little bit of negative synergy is possible in some situations. So we see that even if the two TFs bind to the same side, we should uh, be able to see the emergence of synergy from this situation at least from a theoretical perspective. Now, what happens uh, experimentally? For this, we measured synergy between pairs of TFs that um, have been described to act on different steps of the transcription cycle. Um, so you, as you see here, there are two TFs that have been described to predominantly act on initiation, whatever, like probably like the um, recruitment of polymerase basically, or like the first steps. 
and then elongation, and then a TF that has been described to act on both steps. And when we measure expression in combination and in, the, in response to a single TF, and we take, we quantify the synergy, what we see is that for the pairs of TFs that are composed of an initiating and an elongating TF, we see that positive synergy emerges. However, in contrast to the model uh, results that I showed before, the synergy here is relatively weak. And so we wanted to understand what could be the reason for this uh, relatively weak synergy that we see experimented. So for this, we went back to the model and asked, what are the features that determine whether two transcription factors generate a lot of positive synergy? So first we assessed the effect of the strength of the transcription factors. What I showed you before is the region that the model um, can um, span under certain assumptions for the parameter ranges, which are quite broad. So I'm, I was assuming like a parameters can, can vary over four orders of magnitude and a, a transcription factor can accelerate a given transition a thousand fold. If we now uh, constrain this uh, much more, um, we see that the synergy region that the model explains shrinks and it would continue shrinking the more we constrain uh, all these uh, parameters. So one reason why um, the, syn the experimental synergy is small could be due to the fact that experimental TFs that we are using are relatively weak. Next, we investigated another point, which is to what extent the TFs need to be very complementary to generate a lot of synergy, or there is also something else uh, involved. And so to answer this question, we sampled a set of parameters that span a wide region of the synergy space. And we quantified the complementarity of the TFs in the model with this measure that we called activity distance, which basically, if it is large, it means that the two TFs do very different things. And if it is small, it means that they do more or less the same. And then we looked at what is the distribution of distances for um, the parameter sets that produce each of the three types of synergies. And what we see is that there is a big overlap between the, the activity distances of the TFs that generate positive synergy and those that generate asymmetric synergy. So what this is telling us is that the fact that two TFs are complementary to each other is not enough to generate a lot of positive synergy. And if we think about it, we realize that in fact, there is a, a, another point in this, in this system that's very important, which is how the TFs find and unbind. So here, because we only have one binding site, for the TFs to be able to synergize, they have to be able to bind and do their job and then unbind so that the other can bind and continue the process. And so we can um, intuitively see that if the binding and unbinding and the other transition rates are not well balanced, then probably the transition, uh, the synergy that, that the TFs can produce is going to be affected. And so to give you an example of this, um, this is uh, showing the model behavior as a function of the unbinding rate of the TFs. And in, you can see that as the unbinding rate increases, which you can think of as a decrease in the binding affinity of the TFs, the expression goes down. This is typically what, what we know. You, less binding affinity means less expression, but it goes down at a different rate for the individual TFs and the combination. And what this means is that synergy moves from being positive to being asymmetric. And on the contrary, we also found other parameter sets that generated the opposite behavior. So as the affinity was uh, increased, so sorry, as, as the mining rate was increased, so the affinity was reduced, more synergy emerged. And again, this is because of this uh, tight balance that has to, to, to be present between the binding and the binding and the other um, transitions in the system. So moving forward, we are interested in um, experimentally uh, checking this, this prediction. And this is something that can be done by introducing mutations in the zinc fingers of these synthetic TFs such that their affinity is reduced. And we are also investigating the, the situation where each TF has its own binding site because you could, you could say, well, this binding, the effect of the binding kinetics is an artifact of this scenario where the two TFs are binding to the same site. And if each TF has their own site, maybe it doesn't matter. But what we are finding is that it, it does. Even if each TF has its own binding site, 
the binding and unbinding rates are very important uh, for determining their, their combined uh, response. And the, the response can be quite non-trivial as a function of the binding kinetics. So with this, I will end this part. Um, if there is any question, maybe we can answer it or um, we can move to Angela for closing. Go ahead and ask questions and I will, and I will get my slides going to, um, to close us up. Thank you, Rosa. Rosa, if you can stop sharing your screen, then I can do mine. All right, no questions. All right, so, you know, the, the stories that we tried to tell you about today were really about trying to get away from this sort of giant protein complex view necessarily of transcriptional regulation. They certainly, they certainly happen. There are many, many proteins involved and they're quite big. Um, big complexes, but to start thinking more about this sort of functional collaboration instead of who's touching who, but maybe, but maybe who who is there, who's at the party, um, and the reason why that um, I think is helpful in thinking about this question of precision and plasticity is because it kind of releases us from this constraint of sort of linear DNA and the relationship of all of the individual sites to one another. Um, as a as a uh, the primary dictating principle of of how an enhancer might work. Now, it's undoubtedly true that site rearrangements are important and the position of sites are important, but it's also true that there are many such arrangements that can make a functional enhancer. So I think it's incredibly important for us to also think about the dynamics. I think this goes back to Eric's question at the beginning about the role of chromatin. If these are constant dynamic processes where the recruitment of a cofactor can um, sort of ratchet through a process, that could be quite helpful as a sort of mental picture of what the, how the dynamics might be working. Um, but there are many such pictures. Thinking back about this kind of cartoon, it's now clear that it's deeply inadequate, right? Um, and there are many people who are drawing cartoons that look sort of more like this these days where tire loci are collapsed, or even pictures that look sort of like this, right? Um, and I put these kinds of cartoons up, not, you know, not because um, I want to poke holes in them necessarily, but because I want to point out that this is where our, the limits of our thinking, right? Like what, what does this loose connection mean in, in precise terms, right? What, uh, what is the blue cloud in this picture? What are the bidirectional arrows in this picture? Right, and so I think this sort of loose consortium idea is certainly um, widespread. It's coming from a number of other lines of research um, as well, where there are transcription factors that don't even have to be bound to the DNA in order to be having an effect, things like this. And I would just really highlight that there is a strong role for theory in this space, not only in terms of interpreting data that we get, but even guiding which experiments we would do in the first place. Because the experiments themselves, especially if they are quantitative, are extremely time consuming very and very hard to do. You don't want to undertake them unless you, they're going to be decisive. And so using theory to reason about systems like this and asking how they could possibly behave and asking whether or not we can prove things that they do not do or cannot do and sort of systematically rule things out, I think is a really promising um, way forward. Um, I also want to just put in a plug for synthetic systems or really simple synthetic systems as a, as a way of having enough sort of precise control to, to test whether or not some of the features that we think are working um, are really, really at work. So um, I always like to leave people with one really big message at the end of a talk in case you dropped in and out. This is especially too, true over Zoom. And here I want the message that we leave everybody with is to rethink the sort of nature of cooperativity and whether or not it really is um, so, so dominated by uh, protein assembly and maybe even begin to think about how other words might inspire different kinds of mental pictures or metaphors for us to think about um, what a, maybe collaboration or others 
um, and with all of these cases, if you use a if you use a metaphorical word, you have to figure out the mathematical precision um, to define it. Um, this is an old picture of my group, um, which I dug out so that I could highlight um, some people who contributed to the work, the preliminary work that you saw today. Um, in particular, Javi and Jihei and Clarissa, who is in the middle, um, who did the initial work on kinetic synergy. Um, here are pictures of our many collaborators who always look more dignified in their pictures than, than we do. Um, in particular, I want to thank Al Sanchez, who helped us with the early um, kinetic synergy theory, and then Mo Khalil and Minhee Park, who worked on the synthetic system with us, which has been a real joy, and Jeremy Gunwarna, who's been a longtime collaborator on many projects, including on the theory work that Rosa presented today. And I, of course, want to thank you and our funders and take uh, more questions if there are more questions. Yes. Um, if we go back to that thing at the beginning where you said, you know, um, A, B, A and B additive, um, uh, surely a naive question, but if one does that sort of thing yep. and fits, a, let's say you just sort of learn a quadratic model from that basically with T, F, Y, I, J, K, these present, these absent, yep. you fit a quadratic model to that data, does that predict, you know, three point mutations. So where you've abrogated the binding site with three transcription factors. In some senses, what I'm asking is these, these increasingly nebulous cofactor things that have everything together. Can I still think about them at a statistical level as being comprised of two point interactions between various transcription yeah. factors? Or do I really need high order statistics? Are these really complex structures that really do have high order statistics? Or is it sufficient to have two order statistics? Yes. Um, so I, that's a great question. And we have used linear models in the fixed data um, for many, many years. You can, and there we found you know, limited utility for cross terms in, in linear models even. Well, and when we did find them, they were quite interesting to interrogate uh -huh. experimentally. So you can go back and we can look at, at that work. And um, that was mostly looking at you know specific input output relationships for like a given a given enhancer, mm -hmm. and so that was work both by Garth Ildley and Deepa Wunderlich. Um, in terms of thinking about the other features as opposed to just a, a, a sort of coarse input output relationship, the work we did with Jeremy on the Hunchback P two enhancer, where there is only one mm -hmm. activator present. It was you know, important for us to include higher order co cooperativity in that model in order for us to explain that that clearly is, a not, is, is not linear and a simple quadratic doesn't get you there either. So that is also a sort of whole, whole world to consider. So I think it, it has to do with the sort of level of the resolution of the data that you're trying to explain, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're roughly interested in like who's activating and repressing who, you can get very far without considering any of the molecular mm -hmm. complexity. If you're interested in the dynamics, you have to, or the, pre the precision of the response, you have to think a lot more about the, mm -hmm. about the degrees of cooperativity and the complexity. Is, is there a foot and dirty assay you could do that would interfere with transcriptional dynamics, say your version of SKSIC, and then you ask where the embryo flows? Mm. The question and is, can how much can you can, can you mess with the detail genetics about the embryo? Yeah. Caring, yes. So the question is, is there a way to um, tweak the dynamics and ask whether or not the embryo cares? Um, I don't know a specific experimental perturbation that like you know would would target that precisely. You could certainly you know, swap out enhancers that do, you know, are, are poor behaviors and ask whether or not the, how the patterning system recovers um, and how it responds. My guess is that it will recover um, relatively well. I mean, the, the, the segmentation network in flies is really robust to all kinds of perturbations. Um, 
how that relates to actual selection, I think is much harder to understand, right? We can, we can watch it and be like, oh, it's stripes recovered. And like, oh, the, most of the flies still lived. But the question of how, how strict the, the selection is for reliability and, um, and sensitivity to other kinds of perturbations that we wouldn't see in the lab, that I don't know how to answer. Um, I think that the overall question of like, how much do these dynamics really matter? Um, the reason why I'm interested in them is because I think they're diagnostic of mechanisms underneath, right? And I'm more interested in the, in the question of how do the mechanisms constrain what evolution can and can't achieve out of these systems? Because you imagine, right, there are some mechanisms that are very hard to move around in evolutionary space and other mechanisms that would be easier to move around. So for me, the dynamics are more of a window and less of a phenotype sort of in and of themselves. Bill, are there other questions in the chat? Uh, I am not seeing any. Um, so it might be that it's time to, um, maybe yes, maybe yes, I don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rather than shouting across the room. Um, right, so maybe it's time to thank uh, Angela and Tim and Rosa for, um, for this lovely talk in, in, in three parts. And um, we will reconvene at, well, 1 p.m. Eastern. I know you're not all in the same time zone. So at, at the hour, I guess, would, works for everybody. Um, and uh, I think if you continue to put things in the chat, then um, uh, they will likely be, be answered um, uh, at some point, um, and we'll, we'll keep track of them. Um, but I think everybody could use a break also. So, um, so we will see you uh, at one. And um, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Well, keeping to a schedule, we'll we'll start at the appointed time, and and people may trickle in. Um, the the title for the day was genes, geometry, and development, and um, well, the genes part is obvious, and the development is obvious. The geometry is uh, has a double meaning, um, as you'll see from the from the two talks uh, remaining in the day. Um, there's the geometry of the developing organism itself, and there's the geometry of the underlying dynamics. And I think uh, in Mara Fumani's talk, which is coming up, uh, you'll you'll get a glimpse of this, and it'll, that uh, dual nature will get. Uh, even clearer as the afternoon wears on. Um, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Madhav here uh, from Northwestern, um, where he is in I guess, the Department of Applied Mathematics um, and uh, has worked on, on a wide range of problems uh, between the mathematical and biological sciences. And um, he's gonna tell us today about, I think, quite recent work. So please. Thank you, I will. I always ask if everyone can hear me. I unfortunately can't see anyone else. So, um, okay. So uh, right from the get-go, just thank uh, various people, most importantly, uh, Rich Carthew, who is a very dear friend, trained as a biochemist and uh, now a fly geneticist and very open-minded views on, on what uh, constitutes biology and even the definite or even the word mechanism. So that's been it's, uh, really uh, great working with him. And actually James Carty, Jamie is a uh, uh, Richard's son, as you can probably tell from his last name and over uh, a Christmas dinner once actually, uh, Jamie and I discovered we both had interests in evolution and development. And um, he was a huge part of uh, this, this, uh, this project in Vasile who actually uh, was rescued by Bill uh, from his string theory life. Um, and converted into uh, looking at biology, and he came to work with uh, work with me, and and this is his work. So, um, so with that, um, I I try to reflect on uh, the you know gene as, as Bill just said, genes, geometry, and development. It's not going to be much of an introduction. I'm just going to get into data pretty quickly. But just thought for those of you that um, maybe don't think about development and it's uh, and don't know much about its history, just a little bit on that. Um, you know, there was a time pre-Darwin, 
French Enlightenment when you had the, the immutability of species and the job was just to go and collect these perfect forms. Uh, and, you know, the varieties that you observe, the different, you know, a family of elephants, why do they not all look like some perfect elephant? Well, that's because the world is messy, but these platonic ideals of these species definitely were there. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, you know, Darwin, not so romantically in his seven-year study of barnacles, uh, you know, was quite depressed. Uh, and, uh, and in his depression, uh, you know, you can read it in his writing, he opens up each barnacle and he's quite frustrated to not find the stereotypy, this one that God, one version of the barnacle that God wanted, he, he saw variation everywhere. Um, everything he looked at, every trait was variable, so to speak. Of course, this was the seed of the idea of variation. A little bit further at the turn of the last century, Darcy Thompson, um, in, a, in a now very famous book, uh, had a very different view, actually didn't relate to evolution at all, even though I think he was thinking about things. Uh, from a sort of let's compare species, his idea was um, if you set down a grid, an Euler, a, a grid, quite literally as we think about in mathematics, and align the vertices of those grids with um, landmarks, you know, eyes, gills, uh, he did it particularly uh, with, with fish, and then uh, you know, move, uh, map that grid onto nearby species, ensuring that the same vertex in the grid maps to the appropriate homologous uh, landmark or structure, he uh, hypothesized, I think he concluded, but then he hypothesized that you would see smooth maps. So that's another idea of geometry, right? When you're looking across species, there was this idea that there are constraint geometries. It's not all hell breaks loose. Um, then about 50 years later, just about the time the structure of DNA was discovered, uh, Waddington uh, had this idea. I will read the quote because I think the landscape has actually, it's. Uh, we use it in a very different way these days, but what he meant it in the following way, which is developmental reactions as they occur in organisms submitted to natural selection are adjusted so as to bring about one definite end result regardless of minor variations and conditions. Eric likes to talk about this in terms of what is, you know, that, that development, the outcome of development is so to speak generic. What that means, and, and I think that word is used in the mathematical sense, which is if you jiggle the parameters of development, be it genomic parameters or environmental parameters, the outcome will be somewhat similar. And so uh, I think uh, Waddington was appealing to this idea that the dynamics have attractors with their basins of attraction in the sort of uh, dynamical system that is development um, and, uh, and that you would have this sort of, I hate to use the word, but robustness to uh, variations and parameters or an insensitivity. Um, and Waddington didn't think much about responding to DNA. Him and uh, he, he, of course, uh, said, you know, yeah, sure, the landscape, somehow this dynamical system is underpinned by the genomic degrees of freedom in the system. But he actually didn't think it was that important to, if you read his writing. Um, he thought that was a detail and Crick and him had a famous fight about that. And now just a modern view for those of you that, uh, you know, I'm an outsider. I, 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 uh, I know very little about most things, but, uh, uh, this is at least the, the 30,000 foot view I still think we have of development. And you can get this if you read this beautiful book called The Making of the Fly. Um, th this is the, the lookup table that we have in development. So let's talk about the fly wing because it'll be the model system of choice for me. I will only be presenting data today, unfortunately, no models. Um, and the idea is uh, you mutate uh, certain genes or you do a, a screen where you mutagenize populations of flies and you get altered wings, not just their shape. Some of them, the veins are thicker. Sometimes veins are missing. Sometimes compartments are missing. There are actually hairs that you can't quite see on this. Sometimes the pattern of the hairs are altered. Suffice it to say that the pattern, the entire phenotype uh, is altered by a large number of alterations in genes. And so you might start thinking about phenotype space, phenotype space of, let's just say for now, this wing. And the way you might conceptualize this is that, you know, this could be a vast space. Who knows? Maybe it's number of veins, thickness of veins, uh, area of wing. You can come up with an innumerable number. So I've just outlined three here, but hopefully you see my little dashed uh, arrows just to give you a sense that there's many more dimensions. And somewhere in the middle, maybe there's some wild type, which you should, I will refer to a lot about, I will talk a lot about in this talk, what really, what do we mean by wild type? 
you know, perhaps mutants sort of land you somewhere in this space. When you change environment, you land somewhere else. Change the species, you land somewhere else. And so the map that emerges is this very complex one. You know, if you ask, uh, go to your books, go to your textbooks and ask how many genes are implicated and have strong effect phenotypes in, in the wing, you will get an answer that's on the order of a thousand. On the order of a thousand genes, even to your, your, your eye, to your, to your human eye, um, have altered uh, you know, morphology, structure, whatever this image is. So, so the, the space of genotype, the genotypic space of relevance is incredibly high. Apparently, when you mutate or change environment or change species, phenotype just changes. And it's not clear that in any sense it's low dimensional or, or understandable. There's no real geometry. And of course, you all know that one gene can have many phenotypes and one phenotype can have many genes. And so you're left with this sort of a hairball. I think this, I, I don't mean to uh, be derogatory about the current state uh, of things uh, in this field, uh, but uh, this, is, this is how I sort of have it um, in my mind on a one slide uh, rendition. And of course, this map is even more complicated because it's development. It actually uh, happens over time. So this map somehow in its, all its complex glory ensues over time. And we all, people study this sort of detailed mechanisms of that. There are these beautiful questions that le are left unanswered. And I, will, I really will directly empirically try to get to these questions today. Question of variability. What does wild type really mean? Or what does even a mutant mean? You might have a mutation in a gene, but in one of those vials with, where, we, where our friends keep flies, Remember, flies are not worms. They are not clonal. They're not isogenic. There is standing genetic variation, even in an inbred vial, let alone an outbred population, let alone what's out there when you leave a banana peel in the garden. So how do, where is this, inter, this, this individual level variability? And, and what is the geometry of the phenotypes that are explored by that minutia of variability? Can we even begin to talk about that? Then this Waddingtonian challenge, which is, uh, well, how do the phenotypes actually, is it the case that phenotypes change in some, I hate to, you know, are they somehow desensitized or, or how do they cope with variations in the, in the, in the, in the dynamical process? Because uh, again, let me refer to you to one of those vials that uh, our friends have in their labs. You might say it's at fixed temperature and fixed diet. That is not true. It might be the case. Temperature is no doubt varying. Now you have to ask yourself the question, how much variation in temperature that happens in all these labs matter? Unclear. And certainly diet is not invariant because there's behavior and you know behavior is variable across individuals. And so even the diet, you might have the same molasses that you're feeding them, but the in, you know, from individual to individual, diet is variable. So, so how do we begin to ask this question? What is the geometry of the phenotypes and therefore the geometry of this map? And lastly, this question about the geometry of species. Um, is there any, any sense in which Darcy Thompson, uh, can we even address it empirically? And so I will try to attack these three questions today. And I, to whatever extent, uh, I'm sure it's a failure, but I will try. So the system is um, the fruit fly wing only chosen because uh, it's, uh, you know, you, you can see them with your naked eye, you have to pluck them. And uh, we plucked thousands of wings over three years, quite literally 3,000 wings uh, in different statistical ensembles. I'll go into details as to what that is, but uh, yeah, it, it's somewhat easy to pluck. I report to you, it's not that easy. They're about as fragile as gold foil. It's not that easy. Um, the phenotype, the, 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 the organ is almost two-dimensional. Uh, it's actually a bilayer, there, there are two layers, but if you flip it and look at the backside, it kind of looks like the front side. So just taking an image, sort of, is the whole trait, uh, not that we should be cutting up the organism, but you, know, you have to start somewhere. And now this is where I feel like I would make my point as a physicist. Uh, you know, some of the most, for me, the most beautiful areas of physics are when you discover how to describe a system or parameterize a system. That for me is the beauty of when you, you look at the appropriate level of description. And the description that exists right now is one that is referred to as landmark based or procrustis. Uh, there's all sorts of words, but the essential idea is uh, you go to a textbook, you go to the, the Drosophila gods, and they tell you that you should look at these 12 points, which are rather obvious why they're chosen. They're chosen where rather dark structures coincide with other dark structures. You can just click on that point. And so phenotype space, which is this, you know, this, this image, is reduced to 24 dimensions, right? 12 landmarks, 
x and y location of every landmark, 24 dimensions. That's the dimensionality of the, of the space. Um, I can report to you that once you start looking further afield and, and really querying whether this is not just a good parameterization for the wing, which I will hopefully convince you that there are other ways of attacking this problem, but as, a, as an entire approach, as a quantitative infrastructure, uh, when you go to, for example, Darwin's finches, uh, you can see this is the way you're meant to landmark. There are 15 landmarks. And for, you ask, why is the landmark 9, 14, and 11 in a straight line? Uh, no answer. Uh, it, it's, it's, and, and of course, the number of landmarks starts varying if you look at islands very far apart from each other. The whole thing is a little bit arbitrary. So there's a, there's a methodological aspect which I want to emphasize, which is how do we parameterize such systems? But let me just tell you a little bit about, about more about landmark based. Let's say you got two wings in the lab. Let's say one was uh, females have larger wings. So let's just say the red one is the female and the male one is the blue one. Sorry, yeah, did I say that right? The red and blue, they're two wings. Here are the, the steps you're meant to do. Uh, dilate until they have the same area. Rigid body translation until their centroids overlap. Rigid body rotation until, you know, in some senses their major and minor axes align or something like that. You, you can imagine what that is. There's a mathematical version of this, but I think it's sort of obvious what that is. And now if you look at a population of outbred lines that we, um, I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, um, nonetheless, this is the kind of nature of the data, right? So you, now you can see this is a 200 male wings outbred uh, population, Melanogaster, a 25 degrees rich diet, which is the usual diet. And you can see the data is now these clouds of landmarks. And, you can imagine doing a covariant study of these landmarks, right? That, that's the usual approach. Just a little comment about outbred. The way we did this was over a process of two years. We ordered stocks, 42 inbred stocks from around the world, from Japan to Dresden to the West Coast to East Coast. And we, we, we crossed them into each other over a period of two years, um, in large part because these inbred vials are at such small, these vials that you've probably all been seen, those are such small population sizes that they're inbred. I mean, they're, they're sweet, they're drifting all over the place. And to really be able to reveal genetic, the inter-individual, if that makes sense, the within individual variants, uh, looking at an outbred population is, is relevant. Um, by the way, uh, I will absolutely stop at certain points, but uh, you know, I'm very much from the physics tradition where talking to myself, uh, we get kind of sad. So uh, please stop me. So one thing about parameterizations, and this is again, very much uh, in, the, in the idea of physics. This is a movie from uh, Suzanne Eaton's lab. Uh, she did some of the seminal work on pupil wing uh, patterning, and morphogenesis. This is the terminal stages of pupil wing development before you get the kind of adult image that I showed you before. I hope you again, I'll, I'll play it again. Right? I hope you see that there's a, there are clearly long wavelength, large scale patterning going on. And at the end of which we just drop down these points, right? That's the parameterization we're meant to, uh, meant to do. And what I'm going to try to tell you is that this whole project was uh, motivated by this question of particles versus fields. What's the correct description of this system? And uh, just to tell you a little bit more, if you actually take that movie and you just do PIV, you just try to calculate the velocity vectors in that cell flow field, you see that the cell flows are incredibly long wavelength. They're smooth over space and time. Looks like a field. It doesn't look like a bunch of particles. It doesn't look like you should parameterize this with, by a bunch of 12 particles. And so here's the question. How do you measure fields in final form? How do you take a more continuous description um, of this phenotype that goes beyond um, these 24 numbers that you get through landmarking? That, that's the methodological question. The hopefully I convince you at the end of this, there's some science as well, but here's the methodological question. And the, 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 the inspiration came from protein alignments and, and DNA uh, analysis of sequence data. You know, one of the most crucial things at the beginning of every statistical study of protein sequences um, or, or nucleotide variation is alignment. You, you make sure you actually look at um, a length, a string of letters of the same length uh, and you've hopefully found a way to put them in register that now I can go into every column and do statistical and do statistical mechanics. It's the alignment that's a key thing because if you're off the alignment, you're now comparing the wrong positions in the protein and you know, you're off, your, your measurement noise will swamp all your, um, all, your all your results. And so here's the approach we came up with. 
Uh, again, thousands of images, but in each ensemble on average, we had about two to 100 to 200 wings. I'll get into these numbers. That's for example, the males at 24, Melanogaster, 24 degrees Celsius, rich diet. Those are the original images. And then we did alignment using uh, some um, uh, Riemannian mathematics. Uh, for those of you that know, uh, Bernard Riemann, uh, a mathematician, German mathematician that uh, really developed a lot of uh, complex analysis, if not all of it. Um, and one of the beautiful ideas of conformal maps. So uh, I'm not going to go into any of the mathematical details, please, but this is a 90 minute presentation. So you can stop me and ask questions. But the idea is you, all you need to do is uh, find the boundary of this wing. And now you can map that boundary to uh, the boundary of a unit disk, a sort of prescribed shape. And so every image that I take can now be mapped uh, and their boundaries have, so to speak, been aligned. And all the variance that is inside the boundary of the wings is sort of uh, pushed into the bulk, right? So they're exactly like the proteins. The boundary has been aligned at precision. You might ask me, why was I so concerned about this? It turns out that, for example, with that data, if you do the landmark analysis and you see the halo of the cloud of jitter in any one of those uh, landmarks, and then you simply look at the misalignment between the boundaries of the, of the wings. You, because remember, all I did was overall dilation, rigid body translation, rigid body rotation. That's not many degrees of freedom. The, the, the boundaries of the, wing, of the wings do not align. And in fact, you can show that the disagreement in the boundary shape is on the same order of magnitude as the disagreement between the landmarks. Now that should worry you, that should concern you to some extent. Nonetheless, that motivated this approach. And you might even, for those of you that are a little bit more experienced uh, with sort of conformal, you can see that actually once I map it to the disk, not all of them are aligned with each other. You can see some of them are sort of rotated off each other. So you can simply uh, align them and move the origin in uh, your complex space so as to maximally, globally maximize cross-correlation between, between the entire ensemble. So now for every statistical ensemble I have, different diets, different environment, different mutations, I have aligned the ensemble of wing, uh, wing images in this way. Yes. I would say that for the uh, so so Eric, let me try to repeat Eric's question and then I will uh, try to answer it poorly. Uh, there's a, a whole set of other maps that can be uh, used to to do the alignment. For example, you might pick a few fiducial points on the system and ask, well, morph wings into each other so that you maximally align these fiducial points and minimize the elastic distortion in the, in the rest of the image. Um, I really, I mean, I think it should be done and maybe we should do it, but I wanted to move away from picking landmarks. That's the central idea. I did not want to have fiducial points. <laughs> The, the grayscale image as a whole. As a whole, right. Yeah, it's a great, I, I think we should, uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, I think we should try that. Uh, I, I do not want to, my, my neck is not on the line for the map that has been used here. In fact, I hope I convince you that there's signatures of interesting things that I, I believe would be invariant to the details of the maps, but I have not shown that, so shame on me. But uh, I will get there. But nonetheless, the mathematics we use is um, conformal mathematics that is so epitomized in this beautiful work done in the uh, uh, last 20, 30 years by these two authors. Uh, and this is the ensemble now. So this is, you know, 200 male wings at a fixed temperature to whatever extent you believe genome is fixed, which it's not, diet is fixed, which is not, and temperature that's fixed, which is not. But that's in the lab, that's what we try to do. And you can see that, of course, there's variation, there's jitter. And this is inter-individual variation, right? This isn't an outbred population. Uh, I'm not actually, this is not a mutant or anything. This is a, this is a sort of wild type. Yeah. 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 Yeah
right versus left has, as you know, famously, there's no left-right patterning in the, in the wings. And at a statistical level, if you, for example, take the KL divergence between, or any, met, any distance measure between the ensemble of lefts and rights, which we preserved in this data set, we actually individually plucked left and right and kept them, there is no uh, statistical offset. And, and so the, the why you cannot, good, no, 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 no. Oh, good, Eric, you cannot tell, forget the chirality, just do the, the thing, you cannot tell the difference between left, right, and whether it came from two different individuals in an outbred population, I can't, I've not done the inbred measurement yet, but, but that's the, okay, just for those of you that don't, sadly, didn't take five courses on this topic when you were younger and uh, had to solve some of these things by hand, you know, conformal maps are, the, uh, I mean, there's a beauty of the conformal mapping theorem, but essentially the property is quite, uh, is quite simple. You can map any closed shape without any holes onto any other closed shape, two-dimensional, but it can be uh, corrugated in 3D. So it can, it can be embedded in 3D, but you can map surfaces and their boundaries to each other. And the conformality means that you uh, preserve all the angles in the bulk. That's the only constraint that conformal uh, maps place. Um, there's an interesting comment related to Eric's question, which is, uh, it turns out in two-dimensional shell theory, if you read Landau, uh, it turns out that conformal deformations are stressless uh, in, in, in 2D elasticity theory. That's not a good reason to use it. That was just a, a comment. And, 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 and here, by the way, are how some of your favorite landmarks, I don't like landmarks, and the rest of the talk will not be about landmarks, but here are your favorite landmarks and how they map onto the, onto the disk, just to give you some geographical sense for those of you that are sort of hardcore developmental geneticists and have used the wing forever. I'm sorry to morph it such, but here it is. Okay, so now why do I think this is a far richer look at, look at variation? On the left is your Procrustis landmark-based clouds of your 12 landmarks. Now I've got this ensemble. So now at a pixel level, single pixel level, I can, can, can calculate the entropy. So on the right here is the entropy per pixel across an ensemble, across an ensemble of individuals in a population where everything has been held fixed to whatever extent one can. And for example, you see railroads where you, where you thought you should see veins. Now, why is that? Oh, the beauty of development. That means that across the entire ensemble of images, veins don't move more than half a vein width. And that's why when you look at that ensemble, what you see is entropy in rail tracks around the, around the vein because that's the scale of the jitter. The scale of the jitter in this direction is about half a vein width. The cross veins vary significantly more, which are the things I've tried to outline in black. Those across the statistical on, across an ensemble vary significantly more. Um, for those of you that like Waddington and read some of his classic genetic assimilation papers, cross veinless was the phenotype. Uh, indeed, the cross veins do move the most, and I will come back to this towards the end of the talk. I will come back to. I will at least use the word cross veins again. But uh, the idea that now you see that different locations or pixels or features or whatever you want to call them now have very different kinds of variation. It's not, it's not obvious anymore that the 12 landmarks would well parameterize the space that this variance spans. It's not obvious to me anymore. Um, but, but let's get into that. So now, you know, just like a, a beautiful work that Josh Shavitz and others did on behavior where you looked at fly behavior and you just tried to classify images of, of, of flies. Now phenotype space, not behavioral space, phenotype space is only limited by the number of pixels in your, in your, in your image. So now every pixel is a dimension of phenotype space. A host has half. Sorry. Uh, every pixel is a, is a trait. It's a landmark now because uh, every image now has an intensity at that pixel. And so now, a three-dimensional slice of this vast phenotype space is, you know, every image is a point in this in this uh, in this phenotype space, and a population might have some be a cloud and it has some shape. The shape is, of course, interesting, but but nonetheless, that's the nature of the data. I'm just trying to get you to think about what that data might look like. 
Excuse me. Um, now, what's uh, the virtue of uh, uh, having this kind of data? Just to give you just a bit of an intuition for, for what this data looks like, on the left, you see landmark-based approach juxtaposing the males and females. On the right is just the relative entropy or the KL divergence between the same two statistical ensembles, but now at a pixel by pixel level. And what you see is, uh, I hope what you see is that the two, the males and the females disagree in their traits along the veins between two, so to speak, landmarks. Meaning that if you simply parameterized the jiggle, the difference between males and females by, their relative, by the co-variation of the landmarks, the kind of disagreement that we see we're using this sort of finer scale measurement would not be found because we're seeing that the variance varies along veins, not just at the landmarks. Nonetheless, you can take these two approaches, landmark-based and landmark-free. I'm just going to call the approach we pursued landmark-free and the landmark-based, and you can take the male and female of Milanogaster, the same temperature, same diet, same wild type, and just do principal component analysis, just do eigenvalue decomposition of that statistical ensemble. On the left, what you see is that the first principal component is sexual dimorphism, male, female. On the right, sexual dimorphism is not the first one, it's the second one. And the rest of the talk is about what this is, what this mode is, okay? And uh, it's going to take me many slides to explain how I queried and tried to understand this mode. So if you're confused as to hold on, uh, you know, what is this mode? Is it noise? Is it this? I'm going to uh, go into you know, laborious details because the 90 minute affords me that. Um, but uh, I want to stop here because I think, yes, I want to stop here and ask explicitly for questions if, if people have about the sort of uh, methodology. Uh, how I get to the point of getting statistical ensembles of images that are aligned in the protein sense and that I can then do statistics on. Um, any questions about that? Uh, yeah. Hello, uh, can you hear me? So obviously the mapping from 65 to 60 is done. But in like the middle and the top range yes. are about how big is a pixel this movie is like? Oh, uh, in the original image, you can definitely see cells because every cell has a hair and you can see hairs in the original. You are uh, un unfortunate. Uh, you're, you're asking me how many, how many pixels make a cell. Um, in the middle of the image, linear dimension, I would say is about five to 10 per cell, per cell. The, yes. Per cell. The entire image has, I think, if I remember, tens of thousands. There are tens of thousands in a disk. Um, these were quite high resolution images. In fact, you can even see the, at the top, I'm sorry, you can't, at the top, do you see the, in the compartment? Um, the, the, those are actually individual hairs and individual cells. Um, but as you rightfully, uh, the dilation associated with the conformal process is not invariant across the disk, and therefore that scale factor that you're asking is indeed variable. Okay, so how do I, yes, so yes. I realize that you're, you're not picking landmarks, but you are, um, you're, you're, you're aligning, for example, the boundary. Yeah, absolutely. Than absolutely. Um, in the same organism, but at a different stage. Uh, oh, that's know, it's very hard. Uh, aligning, aligning peaks and frogs, you know, align, aligning extrema, of course, pushes all the variability into the middle. Yes. Um, and you can confuse yourself a little bit. You know? I, I, I think Eric's question, your question, is this the best way to have done the alignment? I don't know. I, I can't, I, do, I don't know. Uh, at least I try to encompass all of the traits. You know, by by making the privileging the boundary, you're seeing all of it. Um, one thing that we should do, and and actually Vasil is in the process of doing, is mapping it back, not mapping it to the unit disk, but mapping it onto a reference wing, and therefore the distortions of the areas are now much much less, right? Because what you're concerned about is that your original wing shape. You know, your concern, I'm sure, is much deeper than I'm, but. You had an anisotropic shape, you had an ellipse. I squeeze it into a circle 
no doubt I'm losing fidelity resolution at the, at the long ends, right? Because of the process of mapping. Uh, there's no doubt this, I, I don't think I want to convey that this is the optimal mapping in any sense. Not at all. But the, other, the other question is the, the benefit, right? The, the good news is that you're able to look at the entire image. Yeah. The bad news is that you now have to put a very high image. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, like no I can, doubt. I can stop what, you know, if I only have a limited amount of data, I can, I can, I can take a limited number of landmarks. Yeah. Um, is, is it going to turn out that there's a way to do this? Uh, I, I, I am going to do experiments to try to give meaning to these, these different modes. And it's got, my answer will all be empirical, no right. models here. And, uh, but I will say one thing, which is that uh, as you of course know, you know, in, 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 in continuum mechanics, for example, uh, you've got uh, an infinite degree of freedom, a system, but they are long wavelength perturbations. So you can have low dimensionality in systems that nominally appear to have high dimensions, right? It, it, that's what field theories are. So, so, okay, we'll get in, let's get into this. So, yeah. Can I ask a kind of philosophical question? Yeah. So, I often like to think about what sort of answers people are aiming for at the end, the way to sort of evaluate yeah. which, like, and the thing that struck me the most in the beginning of your talk was the idea of particles versus fields, yeah. right? And what it would mean to have a field based description yeah. of, a, of a shape. Yeah, and also a field-based description of its trajectory through yes. developmental time and yes. also its response to perturbation. Yes. So if we were to think about what a particle-based description of those things is versus a field-based description, like what what would be the sort of qualitative difference in your mind of the kind of answer uh, we might get? Uh, that kind of description is that a fair question? Uh, totally. Um, Totally, yeah, and that, that's, that's one of the questions. I guess what I will say is that it was only when I looked at these images using such an approach that I was able to see a mode of variation, which is the dominant mode of variation in an outright population that is absent in the particle-based approach. And I'm now going to spend the rest of the talk trying to give biological meaning to that mode, which was simply absent in the other description. The other description, did not parameterize that degree of freedom. So um, my answer is an empirical one. Um, yes, not if by looking in a different way, you might see- Absolutely. You might see- Very hard to discover or... ideal gas law by looking at individual gas particles. Okay. Very okay. hard. Uh, same, same philosophical idea, but I, I want to answer you empirically, okay. always. But sure. primarily focused on, on natural variation as opposed to perturbations by mutation. All of the above. I will do all of the above. Eventually. Here, in this talk. I in, will, oh, okay. I will, so, and I will show you species. Cool. So I guess what it, the, the follow-up I would say then is in sort of following up on this part of the conversation about other methods of alignment in this too, it almost, because the answer is empirical, it very, very well may be that other ensemble-based approaches to phenotypic description would reveal other primary modes. It's possible. Right? Okay. It's but, this, possible. But, this, but this is the general working frame. Yes. Okay. So yes. ensemble description, mode of variation, potential effectors of such of said mode. This is helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. let's see. Let's see if so, I, I get it. While, yes. while we're I don't know whether we're purposefully bald or, or no or good. Um, <laughs> Is that the right point? Uh, yes. Uh, so there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, there's a kind of stream about uh, um, <laughs> whether I, I'm trying to I'm trying to summarize a little bit. Uh, you know how, how where what's the role of of artifacts or noise in the imaging process itself as opposed to genuine biological variation? Yes. Can you get fooled if yes. things that you know things move around? You know, they're, 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 yeah. if the variation is only in dark or only white pixel regions, then you don't see a difference in the M three because we're okay. Uh, let me try to. Uh, I think yeah, I get the gist there's of there's the questions. The kind of yes. The so I, I would say that uh, you know I will not be able to show you all the supplementary figures where we did all the sort of 
empirical null distributions of various pixel intensity things and all of this. Please, there's a paper, there's a there's a paper that that the seal has uh, um, that got published I think last year, where where we we do all those controls. But let me uh, so artifacts. Um, so it is certainly not the case that all variation gets pummeled into this one possibly spurious mode. For example, you can see sexual dimorphism is orthogonal to it. In fact, in the rest of the talk, you will see when I look at other species or inbred populations that there are degrees, there are, there's, there's degrees of freedom that are beyond this mode. So it certainly isn't the case that all the variance is, is in this, all biologically meaningful variance is in this one mode. There's, it's right there at the bottom right, sexual dimorphism is, 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 is smack orthogonal to it. In terms of uh, you know, various things that you can control for in terms of imaging uh, brightness, uh, you know, we we spent three years taking these images, trying to make sure that because remember, I'm trusting the raw pixel intensity data here, right? That's where the landmark based approach has great virtues because you just put down a point in image J and it's the X Y coordinate. Uh, I'm really trusting the intensity data, and so uh, you have to be very careful with lamp and you know intensity of your bright light, and then you can ask, does the brightness of the image correlate with this dimension? No, we did that check, and at various points in this conversation. You should ask me and I will show you what statistical check we did. We did very shuffled nulls and, and things like this, but this is something we really worried about. Um, so I would urge you to uh, definitely, for those of you that want more uh, details, I would read the, the supplementary of our paper. Um, but now I'm going to try to get to how do we prosecute this uh, spectra uh, that we observe? So first of all, um, I'm going to bring back this question of wild type, right? So if you look at this cloud of points in this now very high dimensional phenotype space, and let's say it has some shape, who knows what that shape is, but it has some shape, what might be controlling that shape? One thing you might say is that, well, my population is not isogenic. So maybe what I'm seeing is genetic variability, uh, phenotypic consequences of genetic variability, but sort of natural genetic variability in an outbred stock, not, not ultra bithorax or famous mutant or wingless or cross veinless or something like this. And so one idea you might have is, is the following. Perturb the system, perturb it, let's say, genetically. Um, that will produce a whole new set of wings, points, clouds in this phenotype space. And if the variability in my wild type population has anything to do with the kind of variability that's produced by mutations, you might expect there to be an alignment. In particular, there should be an alignment between the vector that here is in, in purple or in orange, this is the vector that joins the center of mass of the green cloud to the center of mass of the purple cloud. There should be an alignment between this vector, this, the phenotype uh, of the mutation, and the principal components of my green cloud. That's the formal way of asking the question, is the variability within a population related to the kind of variance I generate when I perturb the system? And so you would take an inner product, you would calculate the cosine of the angle between a vector joining the centroids of these clouds and the eigenvalue the spectrum of, of, of any one of these populations. So here are the mutants. They might look all the same to you. Indeed, they, they really should look the same to you. These are, by the way, let me just tell you a little bit about these mutants. I'll read them off. EGFR, mastermind, thick veins, and star. For some of you, these might mean something. EGFR is... Path, there's a pathway, thick veins is the uh, Drosophila homologue for BMP. Uh, so um, that's another sort of famous patterning system. Star and mastermind are implicated in notch patterning, which is uh, re re related to vein, how the veins come into existence. But these are mutations of a very specific kind. Actually, these are mutations that geneticists believe have no phenotype. These are transposable element insertions in the promoter regions of these genes. They are recessive and they've been back crossed into wild type. So it's a recessive heterozygous P element insertion in the promoter region. Me, said, suffice it to say, for, with reference to the previous talk, if you were to look at MS2 output of these perturbed systems, it would be a quantitative difference in expression. That's the paradigm. That's the view, the consensus view. I did not make that measurement. So please don't, I, I am not saying that, but that's the paradigm that there's an expression change it's not like, I mean, it's not thick veins. If you actually look at the, 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 the famous wing that thick veins got its name for, it's called thick veins because all the veins become massive. They only almost get a black, a black wing. 
And of course, there's an allelic series associated with that and things, but nonetheless, these are wings, phenotypes, where I have very slightly altered the system. And to this day, it is believed that these have no phenotype. I report to you that if you use the approach that we've developed, you actually can see a phenotype. Here are the phenotypes. These are the vectors, the directions in high dimensional phenotype space that you should walk to go from wild type to EGFR. That's what EGFR minus wild type means. It's my way of doing vector notation. You should walk and you can see these pixels, or some of them are yellow, some of them are blue. That means that to go from wild type to the EGFR mutant, the blue pixels need to go down in intensity, the yellow or reddish pixels need to go up in intensity. That's how you smoothly interpolate between these different mutants. Is that, if the, if, right? That, so I'm literally, I'm literally making an image of the vector. This is a vector in high dimensional space. And here are the four, 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 um, four images. And now all I do is take the inner product of those vectors with the principal component spectrum, the eigenvalue spectrum of my wild type, my reference population. And here's what you see. And on the right is your shuffled null. Okay, that's where you forget whether the data came from the green cloud or the purple cloud or the orange cloud. You just shuffle them and ask, has the alignment gone away? The alignment goes away. So here's the, here's the set of inner products that you get. Okay, it should, right now you should just maybe, I will go into glorious detail as to being able to explain every number here. But what you should just see is there's a bunch of heat at the top. Huh, surprising. I thought EGFR and Mastermind and STAR and all these things are different pathways that people get like Nobel prizes for, right? And I know that the strong effect mutants, definitely the wings look different, fact. That's how you discovered them. That's how you do the screen. What I'm telling you is that if you just flip the system a little bit, the individuality is lost. And what you see is actually, it looks like the kind of variation that you see in an outbreak population itself. Okay. But, you know, I'm meant to be a quantitative biologist or a physicist, meaning I should care about numbers. So, hey, what's up with male star? Why is that one not aligning? I should be able to explain quantitative deviations from a naive expectation, and I will. So let, let's get to that. But Waddington was actually quite, uh, he was broad in his mind and thinking, and he didn't think that the genes were the only thing that the system should be quote unquote robust to. If you vary the environment, the system should also be robust, okay? Uh, meaning that the, the endpoint should look similar, even if you vary environment. So again, we went and now went and collected a bunch of images at 18 degrees, 25 degrees, 29 degrees, and a poor diet, okay? So now four environmental conditions, each of them on the order of 200 male wings, 200 female wings. Left and right, every time being careful, male and female, every time being careful. I'm only reporting male data in the su supplementary. You can get every, every image you want. When you look at the differences, pixel by pixel, pixel, by pixel Eric. So if, for example, you could move the vein a little bit and get a perfect agreement, that would look like one pixel. Ah, but you, you kind of see that here, right? Like you see yeah. in the 29 to 25, there's a continuous blue structure or a continuous, that means that whole vein shifted, right? Absolutely. I mean, this is related to Bill's question, which is that your description now has many degrees of freedom, but you're seeing that they're correlated when you juxtapose different ensembles, you see that. Um, and again, when you do this, here's what you see. Uh, so here again, the phenotypes, right? So 18 degrees minus 25 degrees, that means that's the direction in phenotype space that you should walk to go from 25 to 18. And I take the inner product of that vector with the principal component, the eigenvalue spectrum of 25 degrees, which is my reference population. Again, you should see heat at the top of this inner product map. And we're meant to be physicists, quantitative deviations. So I should be able to explain those numbers. So I will, I will do that uh, now. Um, let me just say a thing about wild type. That's why I, I put this on here. Um, I just want to say that, you know, we. I say 25 degrees, 29 degrees, 18 Celsius, uh, or rich diet, poor diet. I already said this before, but let me remind you, you know, your, fluctua your temperature does fluctuate in the lab. So when you, your, your flyby friends who run these labs tell you that I'm at 25 degrees Celsius, I mean, please one day just go and put a thermometer there for a week. I mean, that thing does move around. 
And famously, you know that temperature affects development. I mean, famously, the order one effect is size and rate. Those are the two order one effects. And what I'm telling you is that if you gauge out the size difference, one would not, the naive paradigm in the field is that everything scales, right? You change temperature or diet and the system scales. What I'm telling you is that if you get rid of the scale, these maps are actually telling you that there is a slight quantitative departure from scale invariance. And that quantitative de departure seems to have meaning. It seems to be parameterizing wild type variation. I'm not completely convinced you yet, but I'm on route to at least trying to put forward the argument. Okay, so now let me try to explain quantitative deviations. On the left is the genetic data, on the right is the environmental data. And these are all the alignments with sort of wild type, which is rich diet, 25 degrees Celsius, uh, melanogaster. So what does this, let's make a hypothesis and let's turn it into a quantitative null model that I can now try to explain these, these deviations, these numeric de numerical deviations at the top. Let's try to build a, a picture in our minds as to what we might be seeing. So let's imagine these phenotype dimensions are not mine. These are the ones that only God knows, the real dimensions of phenotype, whatever that means, because I don't want to hang my hat on the ones I've made. Here's wild type, and it has some shape. I perturb the system, and it seems like the perturbation moves in the direction that somewhat aligns with the shape of the pink cloud. And that's not just with one perturbation, all the perturbations seem to be doing that. Meaning that maybe the underlying object that we're looking at is perhaps some sort of one dimensional manifold. Perhaps, this is a, by the way, this is a model and I'm going to now only have the only equation I have in this entire talk, which is this model is going to explain these numbers. Let me explain how. So let's say we take this one dimensional hypothesis seriously. I'm going to now explain to you something that you, I don't know what, what age you learned this, but we all intuitively learned this, the idea of parallax. So here, here it is. If I'm on the New York subway and Bill is sitting seven compartments down and Eric is sitting you know, next row, if Bill moves from one side of the train to the other, the angle that I make with Bill vis-a-vis -vis the direction of the train is barely gonna move because he's really far away, that's parallax. If Eric moves, that, that vector, that alignment with the long axis of the train is going to vary like hell, right? That's just the fact that there's a distance dependence on how much variation in the, in the angle I should expect. That's this, right? If I'm close by, my angle can vary a lot. If I'm far away, the, the angle can't vary that much. This is the amount of mathematics that I learned after doing how many other degrees I've done in this. This is a, hopefully you remember high school trig, cosine theta. So sigma is the width of my one dimensional manifold. R is the sort of distance between uh, along, uh, along this one dimensional manifold. And the angle is related to those two parameters simply by trig. You can imagine hypotenuse, base, height, whatever those things are called. Okay, so let's rearrange that equation. And it tells you that the angle should be a decreasing function of r. r is the distance between any two statistical ensembles. So now I can plot that. On the x-axis, I can plot this length of the vector between 29 degrees and 25 degrees, star and wild type. I can simply measure the length of that vector. And sigma over r is just square root of one minus cosine squared of the angle that I've measured, which is the degree of alignment. And you just plot them. And I come from a part of physics that you should not believe power laws until you have an infinitude of decades. And so the point here is not that it looks like r to the minus one. The point being, it's a descending function. This is all the data taking reference population to be all the different possibilities. On the left is mutants, on the right is environment. And I have simply plotted square root of one minus cosine squared of the angle that I've measured as a function of the strength size, the strength of the phenotype. No, no surprise, star males just had a very weak phenotype. They barely got shifted from wild type. And so their angle is allowed to vary a lot versus something that perturbed the, the system a lot. So it seems like I can explain quantitative deviations from the most naive expectation simply by saying, well, yeah, that's just the, side, the fact that this, this manifold, this one dimensional manifold actually has some length to it. How can I now, now let's step back and, and try to think more abstractly and more in the sense that Bill referred to that Eric thinks about dynamics, the geometry of the dynamics of the system, the geometry of the dynamical system. 
So here is what you might expect. Imagine I, the, the, the crazy dynamical system that is developing. Space, time, transcriptomics, proteomics, mechanics, polarity, everything. All those phenotype spaces. If I perturb the system, I expect final form. If there was no structure to the dynamical system, and each of these perturbations are parameters in this high dimensional dynamical system, the fixed point, which is final form, should just move in Baroque ways, unpredictable ways, because there's no structure in the dynamical system. On the other hand, what I'm seeing is that regardless of how I probe the dynamical system, as long as I hit development sufficiently subtly, slowly, slightly, I probe this sort of very restricted set of varieties along one mode in the system. I'm going to refer to this as developmental epistasis, and that's what it looks like. That's this mode. That's this one mode that everything seems to be probing. So now let's do some, uh, you know, let's do some dynamical systems. So what might this be? Okay, so imagine you had a dynamical system and you evolve it. Let's imagine it's 100,000 degrees of freedom, 100,000 variables, x1 dot, x2 dot, with complex right-hand side, space-time PDEs, right? You go to your steady state. Now you do an eigenvalue analysis around the steady state. You get some spectrum of eigenvalues. And let's say it's a generic fixed point, no particular structure in the spectrum of eigenvalues. You alter a parameter in the system slightly, the fixed point will move in a completely Baroque haphazard fashion. If the system has a soft mode, which is one eigenvalue very close to zero, now if I slightly perturb any, and I really mean that, any parameter in the system slightly, this is a mathematical fact that then you will move the fixed point along that soft mode, along that slow mode. Okay, that this is a, I mean, this is a mathematical fact. I'm, I'm not 100% sure this is what I'm seeing in the data, but this is a fact. There's a corollary to this hypothesis that I will now try to test, which is that if this is true and the fixed point that is the final form of the wing has a soft mode, then the dynamics of development close to the terminal stages of fly development should flow along the soft mode. There should be a correspondence between the dynamics and the perturbations in the system. Both of them should flow along the soft mode. That's dynamical systems. That's like page eight of Strogatz or something. And so here's the prediction. Go to Suzanne Eaton's movies, look at the flow fields and the flow fields should align with this one direction of variation that I seem to be probing when I do perturbation experiments. I have not done this yet. But that's, that would be a very strong evidence that this structure, this dynamical structure is correct because there would be a duality between the dynamics of one individual in time and how the ensemble responds to generic perturbations, but small perturbations. I don't want to say that the famous genes and the famous mutants are not correct just means that I'm looking at very soft effect ones. You should not be so surprised that such a mode might exist. For those of you that you know, we just heard a talk about the precision of development in terms of transcriptional patterns, you know that at least your eye, and even when you do things beyond your eye, you line up 10 movies of Eve patterning, they kind of look a lot like each other. Now the, that means that the, the dynamics are reproducible. If I was doing so towards the terminal stages of development, it means that there's a soft mode because how else are all these movies always converging onto the same dynamical trajectory? So maybe you should have expected developmental epistasis simply because the fact aren't the movies reproducible. Nonetheless, I've not done this yet. I, I decided to test something else. I decided to, I'll stop here before I do species actually. Maybe more questions. Any, no, no chat questions. Mm -hmm. Or maybe just again, <laughs> I didn't show enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but here's how I decided to test it, because I thought this was the this was the real, you know, before investing years of my life and years of Seal's life, you should ask yourself: Is this relevant? Not is this relevant? Is this saying something about evolution? So here's what we did. Uh, we looked at the Melanogaster complex, which was a radiation in Madagascar around 250,000 years ago. Uh, Melanogaster being one of them, 
And there's three other species, Seychellia, Similans, and Mauritania. So Mauritius, Seychelles, right? You, these names mean, right? They're these famous islands that one day will not exist, one day being like 10 years or now. Uh, nonetheless, you can, so we went and got these species and we plucked 200 rings from them too. Um, and the phylogeny you here you see is molecular phylogeny based on, 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 D, based on DNA analysis of DNA. Um, and here's the hypothesis, right? Here's, by the way, four pictures. These are just sort of, rep sorry, you can't see Sashalia, but here are just four images. Um, I don't know, some of them are bigger than others, but yeah, their pattern does vary. Even if you stare at them long enough, the pattern definitely varies. But here's the hypothesis now, right? The, the true Evo Devo hypothesis here is that if development is so constrained that it's producing varieties of a very restricted kind, then in the presence, in the, in the absence of very strong selection, the kind of species that I should be producing should be related to that constrained direction in which I'm producing varieties. So the neutral theory of evolution in the absence of, of selection should be along this direction. Um, and when we do that analysis, uh, here's what we see. Uh, all the three species have some significant uh, uh, coincidence with the sort of dominant degree of variation in the Melanogaster. And in fact, their distance along this mode correlates with phylogeny. The distance along the mode correlates with the molecular phylogeny in the system. Um, just one comment for if you'll afford me that. Uh, Mauritania and Seychellia, when you do the crosses, we did the crosses in the lab, they didn't cross with Melanogaster. Similans did cross with Melanogaster, but only in very specific ways. Only females of Similans crossed with males of Melanogaster. There was some complicated uh, Punnett square kind of thing going on there, but I just wanted to say that. So, okay, let me, let me stop with the species part and just say that you know, Michael, my PhD, one of my PhD advisors did this beautiful work on Darwin finches, right? He looked at the shape of the beak. And what he saw when they juxtaposed different species was that the set of phenotypes that were probed were related to each other. In fact, they were affine transformations of each other. Now you could have told yourself two stories there. One would be development is constrained to produce variants along that direction, or the environment, the environment that selected was low dimensional, producing varieties only along two dimensions. Which one was it? I think I have tried, well, the evidence seems to suggest here that maybe it's of the first kind, that development it, itself produces varieties in a highly constrained manner. And in the absence of very strong selective pressures, which might well be there in, in many instances, in the absence of those, you should produce speciation along that mode. Um, just some future directions. I'll st unfortunately, I'm, I seem to have blown through this uh, quicker than I expected. Remember, I told you we made this outbred population from 42 inbred lines. We actually collected data from those inbred lines. Uh, here they are. I haven't analyzed them. This is just quite literally, you know, some, here's uh, right here again, each of them, the reference population is my outbred population. The inbreds are now, I've calculated the, calculated the the directions in phenotype space that you must walk to get to various inbreds and how, what the angle between those directions and the variation in the outbred population is. I haven't analyzed this much yet. Uh, so, so we'll have hopefully a second manuscript on bioarchive on that topic. There's this question, which is to analyze these movies and demonstrate the dynamical duality that's expected, which is that the cell flows, the dynamics of a single movie should coincide with the directions of variation that are probed when I generically perturb the system. That's another future direction. And something I'm very excited about, I don't think I, I don't know if I've told anyone about this yet, which is uh, to look at these movies. You know, when I, when I last, and the only time I think I went to Princeton, I was lucky enough to spend some time in, with Eric Vishaus. He met me during my interview there. And he was in the lab, as I've discovered is not that surprising. He was on looking down the microscope and he was looking at movies like this. Um, this is just bright field uh, movies of uh, fly development, early embryonic development. Um, you shouldn't be too surprised to now see here what I'm going to do with this. These are cheap movies to make. No light sheet, no MS2. This is as cheap as it gets. Light behind the embryo, cross-sectional, two-dimensional movies. 
I think this kind of data gives the opportunity to look at, okay, I'm not looking at transcription or anything that is sort of chemical in nature. The data is actually scattering. It's just, how does the embryo scatter light as it's coming through? So it's a very coarse readout, but I think it would be beautiful to now look at this outbred population that I have and actually ask, well, if I can now not just look at landmarks, when does cellularization happen or what's the front of cellularization, but look at the movie as a whole. Where is variation a longer, on a, a longer time course until it pops out of the larva? Where is, where is variation more or less? Are stages like gastrulation, bottlenecks where variation suddenly goes down? Is there some reason to think that? Uh, if I go and ask for the famous mutants um, that you know, don't make it and die at some point, what do their dynamical trajectories look like in a sufficiently high dimensional phenotype space? And do they sort of take the wrong turns at various saddles along the way? Um, this is related to Darwin's ideas of heterochrony and how you actually produce morphological diversity in metazoa. So, okay, so the, I'm, I'm moving towards more dynamical questions, I guess that's the point, and juxtaposing just simple movies, cheap movies like this. Um, and let me just step, stop with just some conclusions. One, um, that, uh, that Waddington's idea is that the system can be, can be buffered somehow or be not so susceptible to the specific, specificities of all the kind of variation that the, the, that the system is subjected to, that it can somehow be less susceptible to it, seems to produce this, at least when I looked at it empirically, you don't just see that, oh, I, I to quantum mechanical precision, get the same phenotype. It seems like phenotype is still highly constrained, but it's constrained in all dimensions other than one. And I hope I've at least shown you mathematically that that would coincide with this dynamical soft mode. And, and so maybe, maybe, there's, maybe that's a conclusion to go away with from this duality between dynamics and population level variants. This question of, you know, when I see Darcy Thompson-like things, when I juxtapose different species, is the low dimensionality because of the low dimensionality of the environment or of the actual dynamical system that is the generative process here? Maybe I'm beginning to get evidence that it's the latter, but I think a lot remains to be done. I like to say this because I'm a physicist and this is, this is a very deep point, I think, in physics, which is that you choose a parameterization and that's your whole system then. And beware of parameterizations, beware of how you chop up and measure the system. And uh, I like to end with this with neuroscience, actually. Um, you know, there's two schools of thought in neuroscience, and I, and I love these. There's, there's, the, there's the kind of classical approach, which is the way we should understand the visual system is by drawing these lines and doing different orientations and moving them. And there's this, I think, a more modern school of thought. I, I don't know neuroscience that well, but you should look at natural scenes that have statistics that reflect perhaps the kind of statistics that the system evolved to, evolved in context to, and maybe do, by looking at how the system responds and perceives natural scenes, you might be able to learn something more about the logic at a more systems level. And I guess I would say the same here, which is that the very big phenotype, large impact mutations taught us a lot about the genes. They allowed us to phenocopy and assemble pathways. But if we have technologies and the ability to do statistics where you can look at the kind of variation that's out there in populations, you might learn a different thing. I'm not saying the genes aren't useful, but you might learn a different thing and it might be interesting in a, in a different way. Um, I'll just stop with that and thank Vasil, Jamie and Rich again. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, so Mara, we have, uh, <laughs> we have at least, we have one new question in the, in the chat. I, I, people in the audience should decide whether the earlier questions actually got it, whether they were satisfactory. Yes, yes, yes. Always go back. Um, so the new question is whether the uh, duality that you talk about between dynamical behavior and population behavior implies some sort of ergodicity, and is that necessarily satisfied? So, Oh, I don't, uh, ergodicity, uh, okay. I, reading, no, 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 ergodicity, I only understand it in terms of visiting microstates. Uh, so let me try to at least explain to you the dynamical systems fact, right? 
So if my dynamic, if my fixed point architecture close to final form, which is a stable fixed point, if it has a soft mode, it means it looks like a French Alpine Valley with the church steeple at its base, where you have one long direction that the glacier carved out and all the other directions are these, these things, right? And what it means that if you let a ball roll down the valley, you won't be surprised that they will run down these directions quickly and then along the valley direction slowly. That's the dynamical statement. The dynamic, the, the perturbative statement, corollary of that, or duality of that, is that if you generically perturb any parameter in the system, the church steeple will move along the valley floor direction, not orthogonal to it, right? I've, I've, I've just repeated that. I don't believe this has anything to do with ergodicity because I wasn't thinking about a thermal system here. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I understand the question precisely enough to be able to answer it, but I hope I at least made the dynamical systems sort of order one linear fact more clear. I don't know that. There's also the question of whether the variation that you're talking about is variation of parameters for the impact of noise. I definitely varied things like temperature and diets, right? I definitely did vary that. Right, but, but let's say if you think about if you think about variation within your your most homogeneous oh, oh, population, yes, yes. It's not clear whether that arises. From very the fact that the system is fundamentally deterministic and variation yes. is response to some hidden variation of parameters, or I, whether the parameters are essentially the same from system to system and what you see is the response to noise. I wouldn't have seen the alignment then, right? Bill? It's a question, I'm not sure yet, but the, the alignment that I see between perturbed clouds and the eigenvalue spectrum of some reference cloud. The alignment. Well, look, if, if it's soft in response. To oh, 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 right. Uh huh. Uh huh. I cannot then discern. Fair. Yes, I cannot discern. That's fair. Yes. Yes. So let me encourage people to put more questions in the chat because we have we have time for it. But um, let me take my prerogative. Yes. A couple. Um, you never showed us the actual. Eigenvalue spectrum. I I uh, I um I can you, you you could yes um, and I guess I have a question about whether you know you started by talking about well you see long wavelength fix right so yes um let me imagine that I have I have some field theory that describes some long wavelength fluctuations yes and then the way I decide to analyze it is I measure the values of the field on the border. And I conformally map everything. Yes. Um, is the eigenvalue spectrum preserved? Oh. Uh, if it's conformally invariant. Kind of, this is a, this if is it's a, conformally invariant. Um, but um, <laughs> no, 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 I, that was a joke. No, no, that was um, um, no. I think you must be you must be uh, sort of rotating them. You must they must be altered through the mapping. I mean, this is why at the beginning I said that I think mapping it back to a reference wing that's closer to the shape of all the wings might reduce that effect. Uh, I, no, I think I'm definitely somehow altering it. I don't doubt that. Is there a worry that you could open up a gap? I mean, this is the, the, the nightmare. I'm not. I'm not saying that I have a scenario no, 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 in mind for how it would actually work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is there is there some nightmare where somehow in the act of mapping, you distort the eigenvalue spectrum enough that you create a single whole one but then, out of the thing? Uh, and still leave some things like sexual dimorphism. Like there's still some that are not pulled out. I'm just asking whether I know, but, but Bill, I only have imper. I, the only way I can, I, I tried to suss it out empirically. The in principle question you're asking is actually a good one because you actually can figure that out too, just mathematically. Um, although it depends on the nature of the variation across the ensemble. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let me try to show you the eigenvalue spectrum. Of course, uh, I have to actually find. Uh, this is so such a shame. We have to go and download our own papers. Does everyone do this? <laughs> okay. You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can put them all in one folder and then forget where the folder is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm sure I'm doing that too. 
Uh, okay, I can't seem to find the supplementary here. But but yeah, the eigenvalue spectra are very much there, and the, there is a spectral gap. If that's the question, there is a spectral gap. Um, let me try to find them. No, it can't be here. It's not in this one. Here. Yeah. He has some of them. He has some of them, the spectrum. And these are all above some shuffles now. These are all the ones that are sort of above the null. Okay, so what you're saying is your first mode somehow accounts for an apostrophe cross mode there, and then the rest of the continuum. But I mean, this is related to things that you've said in, in other papers of yours that you know, one, one should not now only look at where the spectral gap is, there's meaning in the other modes as well. Um, but yeah, it seems like when I perturb the system, it does seem to move along this one mode. All these modes align. I mean, that, th th that's something you don't see in the eigenvalue spectrum, right? That the modes actually align with each other. That's where you have to take the inner products between the actual eigenvectors. Um. Good, thank you. Uh, so you, that, that's a relatively direct answer to the question. Um, I don't know. I don't know uh, how to do other answers. So one of the questions with that is within the sophomore picture, it's impossible to predict the outcome of combined vertebrates, of course. Uh, we didn't do that, but absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I can do it with the environmental one. Uh, oh, no, we have a, uh, okay, I actually have an 18 degrees Celsius at low diet. I have that. Uh, I should analyze it. I think we did it by mistake. Uh, uh, but uh, absolutely, the, the, the epistasis, yeah, you should see complete parameter epistasis in that sense. Um, good, I, I should, yes. Uh, Sorry, can you that? I mean that, I think the question I usually, was- I usually think of epistasis as non-epistasis. Uh, here's what I'm, I guess what I meant to say is that here, if I do, say a temperature shift, it produces uh, a perturbation along the mode. And if you do another, a dietary one on top of that, it should sort of move it further somewhere along that thing. Yeah. Uh, meaning that the, the, the doubleness of it should be lost, right? Uh, it should, not. sorry? In the same they may not, add, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, they, but they're along the same direction. I expect that. I haven't done that. Yeah. Other questions? Well, it is not required to use every moment of the schedule. Um, um, we have one more talk. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Eric Sidja with us, um, all the way from uh, 60th, from yes, from 58th Street down to 35th, um, the, the the shortest of the of the of the travels, but still nice to do it in person. Um, and uh, Eric is going to give us a view of um, geometry more in the dynamical sense um, than in the than in the uh, morph morphological sense. Um, and these are ideas which I know have been percolating uh, for a long time, and I'm certainly excited to hear uh, where they are now. So Eric, please. Okay, thank you. Let me get rid of this floating controls. Okay, terrific. So uh, I will uh, discuss, uh, as you see the, as by the subtitle, uh, Embryology, Real and Imagined. The real part comes first, the imagined part, imagined part comes second. Uh, I'll begin with a little bit of history uh, for your amusement and just to set rather globally the perspective, uh, talks about some techniques and phenomena. Uh, you've heard about uh, arthropods in the previous talks, I'll show you about vertebrates. A little bit, then I'll do some theory for as much as people will tolerate. And then uh, that part is elastic and can be uh, truncated at most any point. 
Um, so the goal is to, to examine what happens when you cross physics slash mathematics and biology. Um, there are legitimate offspring uh, for which I would include structural biology, single model mechanics, things that occupy the biophysical society. And then there are the illegitimate offspring, which are, if you like, covert physics, uh, under which I would include, say, Hopfield neural nets as models of memory, uh, genome analysis, as statistical mechanics, and the contents of this talk, which is very much uh, illegitimate and somewhat covert. So it's physics inspiration, but not overtly physics. Um, to give you a little bit of a history of, you know, of, of the Whiggish variety, no doubt, um, biology sort of uh, naturally breaks itself up into centuries, uh, uh, happily. Uh, and the 19th century was very much about natural history, i.e. the acute uh, observation of the natural world. Uh, you all know about Darwin. Uh, you may know less about embryology, uh, a lot of which is uh, centered around Ernest Haeckel, who was a German embryologist. Uh, embryology um, was uh, an important uh, support of evolution, and Heckel, I believe, had uh, uh, sold more copies of his book on evolution in German-speaking countries than Darwin did in England. Uh, uh, there's a very good biography of him from Richards from U University of Chicago. Uh, so people really were very acute observers. But the 20th century was pretty much coincident with genetics and reductionism. Mendel was, uh, we say, although he wouldn't say, we discovered in early about 1901, uh, one understood the linear arrangement of chromosomes and genes on chromosomes uh, with Morgan and his flies. Uh, biochemistry was subsumed by genetics with uh, Beetle and Tatum. Uh, we sh we shall and others uh, then uh, brought development into the under the purview of genetics. And uh, now, of course, we sequence everything in sight at, before we even think or do anything else. The 20th, 21st century, I speculate, will be about integration, i.e. putting the pieces together. Uh, neurobiologists have long advertised that as their goal. And uh, in this talk, I will attempt to outline how uh, development uh, also is amenable to putting the pieces back together, i.e. how you go from egg to embryo to adult. Sure. Yes. Or oh, the, the video. Yes. Um, Voila, okay, I, I can't see myself, but you could see me, that's dangerous. Um, okay, very good, video, video is on, fine. Um, so let me uh, begin by this uh, um, curious book with the title Materials for the Study of Variation uh, with Special Attention to Discontinuity and the Origin of the Species. Uh, this, and the publication date is 1894. The author is Bates and that's less relevant. Um, this, this was a point in time which was post-Darwin, but pre-Mendel, i.e. So the question was if uh, um, variation was to be the source of, uh, you know, the, 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 the substrate on which um, selection was to act, where did the variation come from if we don't understand about the discrete particulate nature of genes? And therefore this gentleman, because to finish the story, uh, the people at the time said, well, we, we know a little bit of mathematics. You, 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 you average two things, you average enough, you will converge to the mean. It's a theorem. If you converge to the mean, you take enough averages. Therefore, why don't we all look the same? That's one of the many instances where a little bit of mathematics gets you into trouble, of which there are many others. In any event, uh, Mr. Bateson uh, was motivated then to go out and look for natural variation. And what he saw or what he collected in this book of 400 pages of these pictures were very dramatic events where there was a transmutation of one appendage onto another, you know, thumb to fingers, et cetera, et cetera. Note the uh, chorality in this uh, thumb to fingers to reflection. In any event, when this happens, for example, with the leg to the wing, you don't get a linear combination of leg and wing. You get a perfectly formed, very accurate, I'm not sure what models level of accuracy, but you get a very nice looking wing in the moss. Similar phenomena was observed in this a classic experiment of Hans Spemann, done by his postdoc Mangold, um, Hilda Mangold to be precise. And uh, here what happens is that during uh, uh, frog development, uh, you take a piece of the developing embryo, which has, as we now know, certain specific uh, biochemical signals, you transplant it to the uh, opposite side 
of another embryo. And what you see, if you have good hands, is a twinned embryo like this, i.e., again, there is uh, a lot of canalization, i.e., you get a, a perfect second axis built, in fact, from the surrounding tissue. So, the, so this is the origin of the term organizer, i.e., this piece of tissue induces the stuff around it to make a head and a trunk. Quite remarkable. And uh, uh, the biochemical origins of those signals occupied people for decades. Classic experiment. So this led to the notion that, as you, you now see with this uh, cliche of a picture, uh, that development is canalized into discrete structures and cell types, i.e., you could, and which of course is an invitation to do phenomenology, i.e., you could study how to turn a, a leg into a wing without understanding how to make a wing. That's a subroutine, but leg to wing is something you could study independent of what the, what the endpoint is. Um, now, this some amount of phenomenology is indeed necessary. On the left, you have a simplified view of the wind pathway from this uh, website of Noel, Ru Noel Nussi, who uh, discovered the gene with others uh, in the 80s, I guess. And on the, so this, there are dozens, you know, maybe uh, 20 players here on the left. This is, this is for the simplified view. Of course, the real view is on the right where there are lots of other things that will stick to these, others, to these primary actors. And of course, I'm not mentioning the fact that there are 19 secreted, 19 secreted winds in human. And of course, there's a large uh, spectrum of order 10 of secreted inhibitors, which block the winds pathway. So all of this uh, requires one to abandon a gene level description because you're just gonna drown. Uh, for those of you who like uh, quirky articles, on the, on the bottom here, this uh, article, this reference uh, to, to Nears, um, this is a uh, literally a Hegelian view of development by a person who is actually a prominent developmental biologist in the wind field, uh, talking about uh, basically making the same, pick, the same point I'm making, genes are, if you like the atoms, but you can't do, um, you really can't study the system based on atoms. And he couches this in dialect, Hegelian dialectic terms, which it's hard to imagine uh, seeing, but it's, indeed it's there. Uh, um, and I could go further on that anecdote, but I won't. Okay, so uh, how do you go from egg to adult? Let's at least see one case of that happening. We saw the very nice pictures of Drosophila I will show you corresponding pictures of Xenopus. So that's the humble frog, uh, a mainstay of development through most of the 20th century. Uh, it goes from egg, fertilized egg, to free swimming tadpole in two days. Uh, it's one millimeter in size. And most importantly, it develops, as my colleagues tell me, in pond water, no special reagents. You just take some relatively clean water and off it goes, um, producing tadpoles with great uh, efficacy and efficiency. The interesting part of that process is sort of after, is sort of in here when you're at uh, roughly 4,000 cells and the, the uh, sphere uh, uh, makes its axes, i.e. undergoes gastrulation. So what you're looking at is sort of the bottom. So the head will be up here. Um, what you're seeing is the anus closing first before the mouth forms. You're seeing the neural plate back here, the future head up here, the uh, neural plate closing to a neural tube, um, and uh, the thing can thing cycle. So basically, uh, that process of self-organization takes place in whatever, 17 hours, um, and it is obviously uh, self-organizing. And this um, picture, and I could you know describe in more detail how you make dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior, left, right axes, which all are part of this process. What you saw in, the, in, this, in this movie, of course, was easily seen by Spayman and his coworkers. What they did not know, which is more recent, is how that morphogenic process is tied to the acquisition of fates. And, and the, the point to be made here, which is generic to development, is that fates, which you think of as transcription factors and genes turning things on and off, uh, those fate determining processes are tightly coupled to morphogenesis because that's obviously how you have to make an embryo to get the right cells in the right place as you indeed create the places, i.e. the anterior, posterior axis, dorsal, ventral. And in the case of Xenopus, uh, in this not highly, not very well known paper, but it looks sound, uh, what you see happening is the 
morphogenic process uh, involves this convergence, this pulling together, the sort of purse string phenomena of pulling together around the equator cells into the midline, and then the cells uh, dive under and actually build, mechanically build the anterior posterior axis by the so-called notochord, i.e. we're chordates. And the remark to be made is on that band of converging mesoderm tissue, there is a periodic, uh, I'm sorry, there is a temporal progression of Hox gene expression, which is dynamic, right? So these, uh, these colored things are Hox genes and you go from purple to yellow to green to yellow to red. And as, the, so there is a, a, a temporal progression in this involuting band, but when those cells reach the midline and dive under and move anterior posterior, they are then locked down. So the temporal progression becomes a spatial progression at this organizer point when the cells converge and extend along the AP axis and build the AP axis. So that is time to space during gastrulation. It's a very important basic phenomenon. Um, and of course, those Hox territories are revealed in the morphology of the skeleton, right? There are five territories which you, which you see uh, uh, defined by these, uh, these cross sections of the vertebrae, which, which would define the AP axis, these Hox territories. Now, um, how can we dig more into this process of uh, understanding how to make the embryo? And there um, uh, we have recourse to what is called synthetic embryology, which many people have been uh, practicing uh, over the past decade or so, uh, myself with the lab of Ali Brivenloo among them. Here are some reviews, but there are a zillion reviews. Um, and the interest here is sort of the Feynman-esque mantra of uh, if you can build it, you can understand it, i.e. Uh, if you're forced to put it together from elementary parts, uh, that's a, a way to force you to understand, or at least it reveals your ignorance, which is uh, uh, almost as good. Uh, so the building blocks here are, as you know, embryonic stem cells, or either mouse or human. And these are isolated from a fertilized embryo that develops a bit, like three or four days, into a so-called blastocyst. And you then break it apart and isolate cells from the blastocyst. Uh, and if you take the so-called inner cell mass, uh, you find with suitable media, that these cells can be propagated indefinitely, but can then be given signals derived from what we know of the embryo, which then differentiate them into these various cell types. These various, you know, the, the cell types that are at the top of development are ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, and germline. And um, it, quite remarkably, these uh, so-called pluripotent cells can be differentiated into all these lineages. What is more remarkable is that many, many people have been showing how assemblages of these cells can undergo some form of morphogenesis and produce interesting proto organs where you're seeing somewhat the right cell types and somewhat the right relative conf conformation. Now, what is worth remarking here, um, yes. Here, as you said, you have to put different factors those blue arrows that give you academic, right. those are different chemists, different right. chemistry. Going back to the space time of the Hox patterns of the Deshpeman right. organizer, does that, so is the view to be had that the Deshpeman organizer in a timed fashion releases factors that then give you the differentiation as they sweep past? Or is it just differentiated Hox one pattern happening, the next one releasing? Okay. How do you coordinate the release of the different chemistry that's obviously what you're leveraging here? Okay, so lots of things are happening in the organizer. The overt signals there are things that, which are, which are not specifically tied to Hox, but which are defined to anterior slash dorsal and ventral versus slash posterior. So you sort of unfold the, so what's in the organizer is among you know, you know, what you need to, to do the axis duplication of the, of the embryo is to put various inhibitors of various pathways in a concentrated uh, package and put them on this um, 
dorsal, um, on this ventral posterior region of the embryo, and they will then induce the second axis. And the precise coordination between the Hox genes and the other patterning is not really deeply sorted out at these early levels, which is a good question. And you would like a more synthetic system in which to do that. And there are certainly synthetic systems that will show you progressive Hox activation. That's work of Danny DeBool and others. Um, the remark, the more elementary remark to be made here is that it is most remarkable that certain types of cells will allow, will, so basically development is, you know, this clockwork process of progressive uh, differentiation and specialization of cells from, you know, egg to embryo to adult. And what is most remarkable here that for this particular type of cell and a particular medium, they will just, they are frozen in their developmental potential and you could infinitely expand them and they have the same potential 25 passages later as they do a passage one. That is most remarkable. There are very few other types of cells in all these lineages where you could do the same thing. And it is not at all clear in any fundamental way why that is. We're just lucky at it. You know, there's no profound reason that I'm aware of which says that these embryonic ones can be, can be induced to propagate indefinitely, whereas things on the endoderm pathway cannot or the neural pathway cannot be very useful for regenerative medicine to have a large population of neural progenitors. At the moment, you have to make them from embryonic stem cells. De novo, not obvious why. It's an important fact, but it's not obvious why. Now, the other thing uh, which is uh, everyone sees is that when you propagate these cells on surfaces here, you get these crazy odd colonies of various shapes. I mean, big ones, little ones. And when you add these protein signals to differentiate them, you get some, you know, never mind what the signal R is, what the pattern is, you add some signal to these cells and you, some fraction of those cells turn red. I mean, you know, and which ones turn red would not be obvious looking at this picture. Maybe it's density, but you know, not precisely. So stem, it's been long known that stem cells will differentiate, but not in a very uniform embryo-like way. It was therefore an innovation, I'm pleased to say, of a theorist who turned experimentalist, uh, who did the very exceedingly simple experiment of simply putting the cells on uh, micro patterns, i.e. disks that where they could adhere only in the disk and therefore controlling the density. And by so doing, he got rather uh, um, repetitive, stereotype patterns of fates when he added one of these differentiating signals, never mind which one, let the cells sit for two days. Everything was home. These are cells in solution on a surface, identical cells on a surface, homogeneous solution, sit for, sit for two days and you get these patterns, which I will say, again, you don't care what these markers mean. They, they are, they indicate different fates in the first lineage separation from the stemness to other things. And that was quite remarkable. Uh, and developmental biologists took, paid attention to that. And uh, uh, I'm informed that in the developmental book of, this has appeared in a textbook. One of some pictures this has appeared in a textbook. I forget which one, not Wolpert, but the other one. Um, anyway. This is a slightly cleaner picture, uh, a little bit more like atomic, you know, this is slightly more regular because you were slightly more careful and you know how to do things, slightly better markers. Um, you know, this is not atomic physics, but for biology, given a thousand cells in a synthetic environment, it looks pretty good. Uh, these are three markers that indicate different distinct fates. And if we now just, so, so the point is to say that what I want to get to here is not the, the biological details, which are manifold and have occupied me for close to a decade, but just the fact that this system exists and it's a very useful system to discern how cells will 
self will, will self organize. And an immediate fact that you see in looking at these slides is that as you change the diameter, the outer fates remain fixed more or less at the same size. You do not size scale uh, and you squeeze out the inner fates. That's obvious just by looking at it. And you know, you have hundreds of colonies on a slide and it's obvious. So you could ask how do roughly 2000 cells in a layer tell, tell how far they are from the boundary. This is not, these are 20, there are, there are 10 cell diameters in here. It's is not uh, proximity. This is not uh, contact. We know that we start the process off with this morphogen and we know from the embryo and our own work and the cells and RNA-seq and all this and all that, that there is a cascade of other activators, wintonodal. Each of the activators has the secreted inhibitor, which are several. So you have three families of activators, all with their respective families of secreted inhibitors, all moving through this layer of cells. Furthermore, the cells themselves have a bottom to top, i.e. surface to media polarity to them. And that polarity strongly influences the cell biology of these cells and strongly influences how they receive and send signals. So there's an immense amount of complex biology here that we and others have spent you know, roughly a decade sorting through, which I will not go through, but it's just to tell you that this is a very, very useful system for what are rather complicated signaling pathways that you could really dissect in a very quantitative molecular way because, the, because these are basically cells on a surface. This is not baby in utero doing a, doing a, uh, doing a experiment. And these are human cells, so you can do the experiment anyway, but it's not even mouse baby in mother, right? These are vastly easier things to do. You could transform stem cells. You, it's easy to put genes in, put genes out, put tags on genes. You'll do a thousand things very easily on cells. Now, what's remarkable about these patterns, which is the uh, footnote, you know, the conclusion of all this, is that here for mouse, I give you a schematic of how the development proceeds. There is a fertilized egg. The egg divides several times to give you an eight-celled thing. The eight-celled thing starts to discern outside versus inside. That results in one lineage separation of these red, red cells to the blue ones, which is a bifurcation in the road. There is a subsequent bifurcation in the road to give you three lineages, the, which are indicated by color here, the embryo implants in mother, and then gastrulation happens. The point of this progression is to then remark that this distinguished group of mouse embryologists, a decade before we got into the picture, we're very happy to conceptualize the signaling in the cup-shaped mouse embryo where gray is extra embryonic, which has signals. And then the signaling in the embryo, the future embryonic parts was these people were very happy to reconceptualize the signaling as a disc. So the point of this digression is in part to again, underline the very strong canalization that these molecular pathways are capable of in other words, we have taken an embryo with its pro very proper three-dimensional shape, its maternal attachments, its extraembryonic things, its placenta, its yolk sacs, all this stuff. And we have thrown away the extraembryonic stuff. We have replaced it by a morphogen BMP purchased from Sigma. And we have then made these cells differentiate given this upstream most inducer. And these things will make patterns whose geometry, whose topography, topology is identical to that of the proper embryo in the sense that the rings are in the right order. And this is happening, we know this is happening because of all these pathways. And we, you know, we could trace who turns on whom, when they turn it on, how the, how the inhibitors work, how the inhibitors make the patterns, how the inner race, the pattern depends upon the inhibitors. There's a thousand details, not a thousand, but many details that have been worked out with all of these genes, which we know from many from, from the literature and from prior work, which was very important, obviously. Um, so the, the, again, it's, a, it's an example of canalization where uh, the, these cells in this crazy geometry 
will do what they do in the embryo, or at least will produce the same topography, topology of fates as they do in the embryo. Most surprising, and of course, it's a very then useful assay to understand molecularly how those, how the self-organization works in molecular terms. Yes. Um, that is a good, that's a good question. We're in the right ballpark. Uh, mouse, mouse is not, is not faster than human for unknown reasons. Uh, this is a wonderful assay to ask about developmental timing, about uh, temporal chimeras. All that is very possible. You just have to do it. Um, Sorry, so when you yes. say you're in the right ballpark, um, it, 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 you know, gastrulation in mouse is uh, two days in utero, and in human, it's several days. And people have now looked a little bit at, at where those factors of two come from, and, which is transcriptional. It's sort of boring stuff to my and, mind. And in this, in your pattern dishes? Uh, the pattern dishes, it is fast, a bit faster. I mean, human is like mouse. So human is a bit accelerated. Can you modulate, can you modulate overall weights in the, in the, in the you can't modulate that. You can't modulate. Mm, no, no, no. Or, no, 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 no. You, you, you can't. You can't modulate. You can modulate spatial patterns. You can't modulate rates as far as we know. That's the. You, you, you could right. I mean, you for, you could ask. Let's mix together mouse and human cells. Let's let let's mix together marmoset and human cells. Who drives whom? Now, there's also that's been done a little bit. So there's also interesting stuff in there. So you can mix species. Do they mix? Does one drive the other? Could you take an early, you know, can you mix things at different times? All that's very, very feasible and physicists can do the experiments. It's great. Um, okay. So lots of people work on these things. Uh, there are 3D models. We, we try to put extra, extra uh, the uh, um, non-embryonic tissues back in. Uh, we, this work cannot be funded by NIH. Any self-organizing stem cell model, they more or less will not touch. They don't fund this stuff because they're worried about destroying embryos. Even though these things, we would not kid ourselves are not real embryos, but NIH will not fund this stuff. It makes people nervous, of which there's a separate digression, which I will avoid. Uh, but the reason for doing it apart from NIH sensitivities, which you of course like to rub in, uh, are the fact that when we look at the process of gastrulation, so here's a big compendium from this gentleman, uh, and the, um, which begins with, you know, uh, um, everything which gastrulates from uh, Siona through, uh, you would think human, but you know, the, the chapter on humans are mentioned, there's a chapter called Miss Other Mammals. And in other mammals, there occurs this creature, and there occur this creature, the armadillo. The armadillo gets more attention than human. That's because we, don't, because we know nothing about human gastrulation, because it happens 14 days post-fertilization and you don't have samples, nor could you get them. You have, obviously people are doing primates, but not human. Anyway, so in this book, there is more known about armadillo than human. And that of course, is the crazy state of affairs. So that's why you do these experiments. Now, these, yes, um, uh, you know, a, a naive person, which uh, who, you know, who, biologists know too much and therefore they don't ask naive questions anymore. But you know, you could ask, how easy is it to reverse differential use? Can you roll the ball up the hill? Is there a hard barrier to reprogramming or is it just progressively a, a, a more and more, uh, uh, circuitous path in a high dimensional space and you just can't find it. Um, why can't we stabilize other intermediates like we can these stem cells? Unclear why, it's, you just can't or no one's found it and therefore you can't, we don't know. And then of course, some of these questions can be addressed with a suitable model. If you understood how the various morphogens push these things around, you might be able to find this, this path uphill because you control the morphogens. Okay, so, um, uh, so you want to ask how to go from signals to fates. 
And of course, uh, you don't want you don't want to work at a gene centric level because it's like doing chemistry from quarks. It's just too many levels between you and the entity you're dealing with, and it's not feasible. So you want some sort of phenomenology for gene networks. Now, if you've ever written down a bunch of kinetic equations for the gene network under this fiction that the cell is homogeneous, which it is not most decidedly, but even if you make the fiction the cell is a stirred soup of something or other, uh, you get these crazy sets of equations which nobody can penetrate, whether you're a mathematician or a biologist. And of course, this is also true of Newtonian mechanics. I mean, once you have, once you go beyond planets going around the sun, and you say the planets interact, it is not clear to anybody by looking at the equations whether those planetary orbits are indeed stable. And even answering that question in principle under, what's, under what they, might they be stable was not done until the middle half and beyond of the 20th century. It's not a, not a you know, not an, a product, you know, that, that was a, the stability of the solar system was a question that was posed for 150 years until it got a sort of in principle answer. And the way mathematicians answer these questions is they don't know what a particular equation is going to do, but what they will tell you is what types of solutions are possible. So they will eliminate, they will enumerate classes of solutions, and your goal is then to fit your model to one of those solutions in that discrete class. And that's the best they could do, but that's pretty good. As was explained to me by a well-known mathematician, good mathematics consists of making the definition or concept such that what you want to prove is trivial. And that's sort of true when you think about it. And, and these cases I'm noting here, uh, it's good mathematics and it made the solution sort of trivial to people who were in the know. Okay, so the deal is you have to turn flows into landscapes. So what am I doing? Oh, well, I'm churning along very well. Okay, so on the left, you have a flow. A flow is a bunch of arrows, right? This represents a differential equation, what goes where, D, you know, dt of time later. And if you look at a flow picture on the left, what you see are critical points, so-called, where, for example, in this green thing, uh, all the arrows come out. So that's a source of arrows. In the red thing, you see the arrows go in. That's a sink of arrows. And obviously, in between those, as, in, as you're walking around Aspen, uh, you see that there are saddles where some arrows come in, some arrows go out. Now in two dimensions, you could obviously translate this, uh, this uh, set of arrows into flow in a topography, i.e. downhill flow in a topography where this uh, uh, source is at the top of a, a local mountain the uh, red thing is at the bottom of the deepest valley and there's a saddle point. And of course, far around this whole thing sits in some bowl so that there's flow inward from infinity. Now to a, so we so, th so there's a source, there's a saddle and there is an attractor. Now, if you think about um, the topography, let's go back the other way. Imagine, uh, this is my level one experiment. Imagine you take a laboratory latex glove, fill it with water and just hold it up, right? So that glove will have five fingers, which are the attractors. It will have four saddles between the fingers and it will have one repeller at the wrist. So the claim is that to a topologist, a glove is like a sphere. Because I could just slowly deform uh, the fingers and just, uh, and just have one, a source up here and a sink down here and just uh, turn uh, the glove into a sphere. Now, more generally, uh, if you ask how flows become landscapes, what you have to do is you have to uh, firstly identify the sources, including the one at infinity. So here, for example, I have in a genetic system, you have, uh, you know, the, the system is stable. So therefore large, level, large values of gene, of gene products uh, decay back to, de decay to something small. So there's always flow from very large values back towards the middle. There may also be internal sources like this. There may be internal sinks, there may be saddles. So to generally turn flows into landscapes, you basically have to find these contours, define contours such that the flow is always transverse, i.e. not perpendicular, but always inward or outward. 
And once you can define these contours, which you do progressively around the sources and the point at infinity, you then can define your potential. Sorry, that, yes. That, that thing that you said very quickly, but it's uh, transversal, but not perpendicular. Correct. That's why you can do this. Even Correct. Pro, right? Correct, right. Because the end result is that the flow is a metric times the gradient of the potential. Right, so it's always downhill, but it's not, but it's, 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 it's a rebound, it's a rebound, it's a, it's a metric space, right? There's a metric. And of course the metric is there to simply rotate the gradient, the normal to the direction of the flow. So what you can prove, right? This, this is non-trivial, right? This is Smale 1962, proving the Poincaré conjecture. It's non-trivial, certainly to me, but the, but, Again, this, this, is, this, this is the fact that if you make the right definition, it becomes obvious, but you have to make the right definition. So here, the right, the right idea is to define contours such that the flow is transverse. And when you do that, you could then make this hierarchy and show that, well, I'm sorry, uh, that, and you could show that for, 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 for systems that would include genetic systems, which I will formalize in a moment, you could make this construction, yes? And the point being that if the metric is uniform, that's a much more restricted set oh, yeah. of flows. Right. Which of course, then you have the usual, the usual minus square potential. Right. But the point is you can, can generalize this. Correct. Any, I mean, again, I, I, I've, I've put some caveats on the flow, which I'll do in a moment, but, but the flows that are, would be relevant to development, right? So any set of differential equations relevant to development can be written in the form of metric times gradient to potential. So, this, so, so in that sense, Waddington is correct, there's always a downhill. You give me some crazy gene network, there is a downhill theorem. That's a useful theorem. Okay. And yes. Sorry, is it easy to imagine what metric I have to construct so that, so that I have a in principle, I should be able to get a closed cycle out of this, right? So I'm oh, choosing the right metric. Uh, it, it, okay, in the case, uh, I will formalize this in a moment. In the case, the, the setup works for periodics. I, I will exclude periodic systems because I have enough things to deal with, yeah, but, no. but, but the mathematics does not. And of course, the potential is constant on the orbit. So it's fine with periodic orbits. Just the potential is constant there, logically enough. The statement of the, of, and of course the metric is not, is underdefined here. The only constraint, I mean, knows what's easy is to find the potential, to find a, to find a Leo, it's easy to find a Lyapunov function. Something which, something which increases, you know, which decreases or increases as the, as the thing goes forward in time. The metric of course is simply, the, the metric is a metric, but it's defined simply by turning the vector field into the normal. That's underdetermined. So a lot of so there's a lot of flexibility. The metric is defined vector to vector. That's that does not fully define a metric. Of course, the metric is symmetric and positive definite. So there's flexibility there, and and how this comes in to fitting models, I will I will refer to examples. It's an interesting question as to how when you start fitting models, what goes where. What, and of course, the interesting thing about the metric is that a potential, you know, has a, 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 a raw potential has a strong asymmetry, right? You know, the, the velocity field one is gradient one, velocity field is, is a cross derivative. So the cross derivatives are symmetric. So if gene one pushes on gene two, gene two pushes on gene one, right? There's a cross derivative inherent in a potential. The metric breaks that, and that's very important. For example, if you want to write an adaptive system, it's very natural to do that with a metric. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to look at dynamics because let me say, if you're a modeler and you want to fit this or that phenomenon, it's a very interesting way to break up the fitting process. It's thought provoking as to what goes where. But it's not obvious biologically, can I give Differential meaning to the grad, grad potential of the metric. It's hard. It, the, all the biology, all the interactions are somehow subsumed in, in the flow. Of those tones. In Correct. The flow. Exactly. In the flow. Right. So, yeah. And what you put where is. As you said, it's the symmetric and the, it's, it's, it's the symmetric part and the potential part. 
metric is right. I mean, the metric, the, the, I mean, there is a curl here because it's a metric, um, but there is a notion of downhill, which is, which is very basic to all these systems. Now I have to define a little bit. Um, okay, uh, let, let me do things, let me do, given the question, let, let me do things out of, slightly out of order, fine. Okay, so is the deal safe, is I have is to it, define a system. I have, so I have to define what's called a more smell system. Okay, so more smell system one, is one in which there are discrete number of rest points, saddles, sources, whatever, no chaos. So there are discrete rest points. And I have to use the fact, which is very natural embryologic, that things are structurally stable, i.e. if I take a, uh, a ball in the space of stuff, of, of systems, all nearby things have the same behavior. Those are the two definitions plus some technical stuff, which I'm sloughing over. And then you could show flow equals metric gradient potential smell 1962. Therefore, more smell system equals Waddington landscape. Now, the reason Smell was doing this is he and lots of others wanted to prove the Poincaré conjecture. Poincaré conjecture says that a closed manifold that's topologically a sphere, i.e. no holes, can be smoothly deformed into a sphere. So if you think what that is about, take a glove, right? A glove is... Um, closed manifold, has no holes in it, and tied up, tied up, tied up the wrist, right, right, this is, this is right, yeah, indeed, <laughs> tied at the wrist, um, and um, uh, you could trivially deform it to a sphere. Now, if you're in 10 dimensions, and you have something with some, so it's, it's very potent to go from, you know, so Poincaré is about shapes, and smell reasoned about flows. In other words, how can you, and of course, when you think about flows, flows are bifurcations. So asking what bifurcations you would make to turn the glove into a sphere is basically proving something about shapes. So this correspondence is exceedingly profound and I'm gonna use it in one direction, smell use it in the other direction, but you know, we're borrowing. So smell proved Poincaré in dimension bigger than five, bigger than equal to five, and two other people proved it in dimensions four and five, four and three, and they all got Fields Awards. So we will borrow this technology of smell slash um, uh, Morse. Okay, so what we will do is we will use these lands. So we will enlarge that theory to explicitly put the parameter dependence back in, which is relevant to us, less so for them. And we will use the fit data. And then we will ask what types of transitions suffice to build the general landscape? Sorry, yes. In the, in the spirit of, of yes. Um, if, if it's a theorem that some extremely broad class of systems right. can be cast in this form. Yes. And you identify this form of the line for landscape. Yes. Then that is not a statement about development, right? The one, I mean, sometimes uh, the one the landscape is presented as, it is important that biology is arranged in such a way that the right. line picture is true. Yep. What you're telling us is, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> so you don't have to arrange anything. Modulo some technical considerations. Right. There is always a potential. Of, of, right, of, of course, the, the question is how useful it is. And that's, you know, mathematics, mathematics doesn't tell you, you know, how complex these, functions are and over what domain and you know how you parameterize bifurcations. Neither does drawing a picture of it. No, of course not. Yes. Of course not. No, neither does drawing the picture. Right. So the, the picture is a metaphor, but you know, I think the, the, the correct statement is that if I take if you take your favorite gene network model, it is of this class and it does have a potential and a metric. And to the extent that that is is your conceptualization of biology, it falls in this category and therefore we, we should think about it. And the, the, the more, um, uh, the, the stronger point to be made is that this is a vastly more efficient way to fit data than 25 genes. Because what matters in the end is dynamics and dynamical transitions. And you don't want 25 genes with 50 unknown parameters 
to obscure it. This, 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 is, this is the simplest way possible without being wrong. And these reduced descriptions are really very reduced and very useful. And um, I, I will sort of give you a, give you a, a, a vignette of this, but, it, but if, if, if the point is made that this is worth looking at, there's a paper here, which is rather voluminous, um, where a lot of this details is spelled out. Okay, so just to underline the fact that the phenomenology of embryology and mathematics are similar, and therefore it's good mathematics to graft it onto something with similar phenomenology, i.e. they're discrete terminal states, the dynamics is simple, no chaos, right? You don't get, you don't want to have a chaotic dynamics to give you an embryo because you never, uh, you never get there, right? That you don't want chaos. It's interesting, but not an embryology. No, discrete terminal fates. Okay, so it's um, what I'm sloughing, what I'm conflating, which I will then back away from. At the moment, I'm thinking about states of cells in response to signals. So I'm thinking about cellular dynamics. Of course, you want to know embryo dynamics, and that will be somewhat slipped in. But at the moment, I'm strictly not speaking about cells, cells in response to signals and gene networks. How do we know um, that there are no so that there are no are of, of cells? How do we know um, that? There, I guess you can't these, hear me. The mathematics makes makes great use of structural stability, i.e., small changes of parameters don't change the topology of what comes out, or you know, it don't change the you, know, you could you could smoothly map uh, the um, results of parameter changes back to uh, original system. Waddington values the basis of attraction, cells define phase like bifurcations. And then um, there is you know, a very uh, central phenomenon of embryology is that basically cells are sensitive to signals over a defined time window, and then they become insensitive and fix their state. Um, are you explicitly leaving no, out multiple attractions? Interesting. Um, is there some reason why there's also another I theorem here can hear me? that um, if you have more small systems, so you have these dynamical systems on the same manifold, you can interconvert any two such systems by using two sorts of bifurcations. One of them is the familiar saddle node, which you may not know, but that's simply the you know the bistable potential, the the mountain, you know, the peak in between, you tilt it and you uh, you know, the, the local minima um, disappears and uh, you get one minima. So, I mean, what you do to turn, a, turn a, a glove into a sphere is a saddle node bifurcation. What you may be less clear on is the other one that of the two that you need to convert between any two systems is this heteroclinic flip, which actually is rather interesting developmentally, as I will show you in a moment. So the heteroclinic flip is something where you have a saddle. So you have, you have three fixed points, A, B, and C. Uh, you have a saddle between A and these other two. And where the flows that leave the saddle go can flip abruptly between state B and state C, but they're flipping up here, right? So it's basically, there's a ridge and you either fall to one side or the other side of the ridge. And I should note that this is a global bifurcation. This is not like uh, a local minima disappearing and then the, the cells flowing down to something else. This is a global bifurcation, i.e. it's not happening. Uh, it's not being described by um, you know, ODEs around a point, right? So here, 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 the things go right or left depending upon how, the entire trajectory from the saddle A to either B or C. So these theorem, these two types of bifurcations suffice to convert all more smell systems on the same manifold. That is interesting for the following reasons. Let's consider, let's go back to our mouse. So in the mouse, there's a great deal of work because it's a mouse, it's easy. This is, these, these stages are, can be done in a dish, not within mother, it's, it's pre-implantation. So there is, a there is a developmental transition which takes the so-called inner cell mass on the left and gives you two discrete fates. One, the so-called epiblast that becomes the embryo, and then this other thing called primitive endoderm, which becomes extraembryonic endoderm and stuff. And we know the signals that do this, and this, we, this is, this is uh, you know, defined exceedingly well. And you could ask topologically, 
whether this transition, which is definitely one way, at least as far as we know, uh, from this inner cell mass to these two discrete populations is described by a heteroclinic flip or by what is called in catastrophe theory, a butterfly. So a butterfly is something which is a described purely by a potential. So there's nothing, it's local. Um, and it's a potential of sixth order potentially. And the thing of sixth order can have three fixed points and two saddles. So you could ask, and this of course is implicitly a one dimensional system. So you could ask, and of course, so in both cases, you have presumably the inner cell mass up here, which can go to either um, epiblast or primitive endoderm. On this other topology, you have to put the inner cell mass somewhere. So what's happening here is the inner cell, so, so you have a bifurcation where the inner cell mass disappears and you end up with epiblast and PE in a single saddle. Now, of course, this configuration makes it a little hard to see during this differentiation. So it's known that in this differentiation process, you could put on signals that will tilt the landscape to, to favor epiblast or PE. And it's a little surprising that, so, so you could then, then, so these two models will have very different effects uh, depending upon how, what happens when you tilt the landscape during the transition process with signals that favor this or this. Because obviously in this configuration, to go from PE to epiblast, you have to go via ICM. Manifested, you, you, you can't get around that. Whereas here you don't. That's qualitatively different. That has manifest experimental consequences, right? When you tilt, this is an intermediate. Here, when you tilt, you, you play with this. So one or another of these is a better model for this. And these are simple geometric models, right? And they're, th they're you know, the usual 10 genes involved in this process. But looking at the dynamics, either this or this model will work. And we're in the process of doing that. The issue of dimensional reduction has come up. To what extent does the mathematics give you dimensional reduction? Uh, I'll be superficial here. Um, to the, this is sort of trivial. To the extent that there are fixed points, there will be saddles between fixed points which have one more unstable direction. However, there are situations, which I will show you an example of, that's where some transitions are inherently high dimensional, unavoidably so. And to make that tangible, I refer to this paper from uh, Corson et al. in Science and also uh, massaging of that in this paper of Rand et al. So it's a very simple system, very intuitive and makes you understand what is going on. So we have a situation where you have long range notch delta. So imagine a ring of cells, here I've shown you eight, such that the cells are initially in some neutral state. Uh, the cells will all attempt to turn on a proneural gene, atonal if you are into flies. When the cells turn on the eight, that, that proneural gene, they also turn on notch delta. And they will, intent, will they, they will inhibit as a function of distance, the other cells. I inhibit them from becoming a tonal positive neural. So what happens is that you sort of get this comp. So here is this um, uh, atonal gene. So what you see is that, so here are the eight cells as a function of time. So initially starting from zero on the computer with no noise, everything grows, but then you start to see inhibition and the things, the cells will peel off from uh, the growth trajectory. And in the end, only diametrically opposite cells will turn on and which ones turn on is random because these are small effects that get amplified. The way you describe this most naturally, easily, and intuitively is simply as a saddle point in a high dimensional space. So I sort of symbolize that here. So here what happens, so I just have two cells or two cells and some made composite. Uh, you start at the zero, you go towards the saddle point, and then at the saddle point you go either one cell dominates or the other cells dominate. So this phenomena you see here 
is very succinctly described by a saddle point in a high dimensional space. In this case, it has five unstable directions and three stable ones. God knows, you know, it has many unstable. Why five and not six? I can't tell you. It's, 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 it's a quantitative thing. So this phenomena, so, so what, what ends up in this thing is a sparse set of, of neural cells, precisely which cells turn on is random, but they're all well separated. So this is a process of giving you a sparse array of bristles, which you see on the notum of fly, uh, in a way which um, you know, is very robust, but is not strictly reproducible. But, it's, it's, but, the, but the understanding of it is most natural and transparent by just thinking of a high dimensional saddle. So here, dynamics must live in, you know, in a six dimensional space for these very particular reasons. Namely, those six dimensions are which cells are going to get the signal. Okay. So that's a situation where the geometry illustrates. And of course, the geometry is a way to fit data. Because most of this fitting can be done by fitting a saddle point. That's very easy. Saddle point and then just has to terminate it in zero one. So you can make a very simple model to get, to get this dynamics. And when you're doing this, you could see precisely when you have to bring in the metric because there is an actual gene model underneath this to which you are fitting. So it's all very explicit, it's done in this paper. Um, to go a little bit further on the geometry, since the people here haven't fallen asleep yet, um, I- Actually, what were you questioning about? Oh, oh yeah, I should stop, yes, please. So there's a worry about the consideration of, you're somehow implicitly considering multiple, there are multiple attractors, but- Yes, well, he, here I have, an eight dimensional space and which, so, so now I've, I've, I've done what you asked. I'm looking at multiple cells, which is a very long story, but this is one very simple case. So I have eight cells, cells are competing, long range notch delta, two will win, which two is random, but they're diametrically opposite. And um, I've reduced it, you know, I've reduced the complexity of their development to basically this one variable, how neural are you as done by these people. And fit the data. So this is a model that has, I guess, four, four attractors. Uh, there, no, there are potentially, no. There's, there's lots more because there's all with there. Are, well, it was terminal attractors, yeah. I mean, in terms of, of things that are stable in all directions, yes. There are basically there is there is one attractor which you could then rotate. Yeah. But you could actually, I think, also offset them by one. And still, and that's also locally stable, but not globally. Okay. And there's in fact a whole hierarchy of saddle points from the most unstable saddle. It's, it's like a starburst. And there, there are saddles. So there's, there's a saddle with five unstable directions, three unstable directions, two unstable directions, a whole hierarchy of saddles. And I guess what's hidden from us in this, in this slide is that the, the actual biochemical dynamics they're living in each one of these cells. There are many species. Precisely, right. This is. But, but in the end, this is all living. This, okay, again, and, and it's a good point to make made here. And what I will return to in the conclusion is that, you know, the interesting part of development is this window of time when things are, quote, deciding, right, which are going to turn on. And when they're deciding, the dynamics is very much about these saddle points not about the endpoints. And the point, you know, the point is also to be made that um, you know, the way genetic screens work is to tell us what the endpoints are when you mutate this or that, right? So a screen is done with a nice, easily scored endpoint, and you simply then look you know, whether you reach that endpoint or not. That's of course a terrible way to attempt to fit dynamics because you have a somewhat random system with, with uh, diverging flows in it. And simply recording the endpoint is a very hard way to infer the dynamics inside. So what you want to do is you want to look at the sort of intermediate time window with dynamic imaging. So you could see these trajectories diverge and that is that tells you what the, what the, what the dynamical model is. And then the famous genes that do have that effect, do they, you know, do you envision them to also, the, the 
which side of the saddle you went on or removed the saddle or uh, I mean, what the, is the view then? They, they had that, those genes, those mutants did unfold over right, time. Right. So, what do you think the dynamical realization was? Um, sounds, it could be anything. I mean, you could get extra states. You could, I mean, obviously, here it's a little bit limited as, as range of notch delta. So, you could, so if you're fiddling this range, you'll get, you'll get a denser set of fixed points, terminal fixed points. It's not. Um, Okay, so I will. Yes, please. I'm curious whether or not people in the field are That is a very good question. You could ask him in part. Um, they ought to be, and in particular, when you we're doing this, and so I'll show you some data of ours. Uh, definitely yes, and in particular, when you combine this with cell lineaging, it becomes even more potent because then you could track. If you were something at this point, what you become later on, i.e., then you could get you have direct information upon these these forks in the road. Exactly. So to the extent, that, for example, here, uh, you know, if you were to tag cells at this early time when they're up here, you know, do they all go here or you know, you know, and and you could do that in conjunction with applying morphogens. So if you mark the cells here and you apply your morphogen down here, when do they get stuck or committed? So it's very potent to do it, but with a model. Yes. Yes, right, right. I mean, but th these guys beat it out. And so that means there's, a, there's another saddle over here. Right, right. Right. <laughs> well, this this is life. We all try and fail. Um, so, but this, this I, I emphasize that these people fit this to data, imaging data. This is what they saw in the data, and of course, it's very potent if you in those and and this sort of fitting should be done embryo by embryo because basically all the little differences as to how which cell is close to which cell and how they're arranged influence these interactions. So you should be able to predict. So every fly is subtly different and you should be able to take initial data and predict that particular fly. That would be the most decisive and they can't quite do this for technical reasons, but that would be the goal. So you initialize back here with your particular fly, you run it forward and you and then you predict all this stuff. And as, as you can imagine, this is an exceedingly sensitive test of these interactions because basically things are bifurcating. So it's by far the best. So, so you want this type of data and you want to confront it with these models, which basically focus on these diverging trajectories, which are organized into a cascade of uh, saddle points of, dec of, de of decreasing number of unstable directions. Okay, um, I will wrap up soon. Um, let's see how much of this I want to do. Um, okay, um, the way we understand these systems is to, okay, so we want to understand now how these systems vary with parameters. And the way you do that, so the parameter space, so here's a system, this is a simply fourth order potential and there are two relevant parameters. And you all know that this potential, this polynomial has roots, could you have three, uh, could have three or one roots and on a, on a special subset, two roots. So in the parameter space, there are domain, there are territories where there are a variable number of roots. And there are bifurcations that are the boundaries between three roots and one root, which are the so-called saddle node or fold bifurcations, which correspond to these sorts of potentials. But the way you simplify the system is to think about a, about a, a manifold in a bigger space, which is to say you add the Y coordinate to the parameters. And when you do that, you get a completely smooth manifold, which simply folds over. And that, and, but this is a smooth manifold. So thing can run around this thing 
and uh, there's no singularity. And in particular, as regards biology, you could imagine a situation where the more with these parameters, i.e. morphogens, are varied so as to go from the uh, a region where, um, say, this state is stable, or the high state is stable, to a single um, stable state regime, and then back on the lower branch, taking you to the other stable state, but never going through a bifurcation. That is possible, mathematically, you know, uh, math math physically. I'm not aware of a case where that actually happens, but it probably does somewhere. And you could ask what types of biological processes would want to have two, you know, have a transition between, between two states and never see an abrupt change. This is the way you would do it. And this is obvious geometrically. Now, um, in this paper, we examine, um, we give you a list, we, we look at parameter spaces that have three states. And there is a discrete list of parameter of, so we, it's all two-dimensional, all generic two-dimensional parameter spaces with three states. How do these things bifurcate? And there's a finite list of such things, modulo, trivial additions of, you know, removals of one, 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 one structure. So there's a finite list of things, a little bit like a periodic table developed not by group theory, but by dynamics. So I just to give you the flavor, it's too many, I'll give you the flavor of what's here, and then you can look at the paper if you, 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 you care more. So, so here is a region where there are three stable states. And these lines that delimit the region are when the particular stable state bifurcates away by a saddle node bifurcation, which is co-dimension one, i.e. it's a line. And what you see here is, for example, on the red um, line, the, the red state bifurcates away. That leaves you with the yellow and, and the, the blue. In the corners here, out here, both the, yellow, both the orange and the red have bifurcated away, leaving only the green, the, the blue. On this point, you see an example of a cusp, i.e. the red state is invariant, is not playing a role, but you, you see that here the orange state bifurcates, here the blue state bifurcates, but as I wrap around this way, there is no change. And the flow fields are shown in these pictures. Again, there's a lot to assimilate here. You have to it's just start the paper. Now, Sorry, in, just, yes. Granted, there's a lot to assimilate. The things in the gray boxes are flow fields. But Correct. The coordinates are the dynamical variables. Correct. So right. So 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 the so the, so the, so the, the boxes the, right. The triangle in the middle is the parameter space. I'm sorry. Yeah, very good, very good. So right in the middle is the parameter space with various features, which I will, which I will um, enumerate. And then the the gray boxes are the flows that correspond to those regions of parameter space to within topology, you know, to within uh, shape changes. Right. And, but this is the topology and, of the flows. And the fact, and if there are only three states, I can put them in a plane. Yes, so, but this and, this is this is parameter space. So I've no, said wait, sorry in the flow. In right in the I, since I can put them in the plane, I might as well. And yes, I, in the flow, I, fine. In, but I only need I, that the dynamic is representable in the two-dimensional space. The dynamics is representable in the two dimension in a two dimension. So there's right. So there's a parameter. Well, one should say that more clearly. There's a parameter space which is two-dimensional by assumption shown here, and then there are these flow pictures for which it suffices to. They, they will live in two dimensions. Now, if my original, if the original dynamics is what they intended to be. Right, but you had three fixed points and you were looking at transitions among the fixed points, you just have to worry about the saddles. So anything you see that is really deep, like these red arrows don't all have to be the same. Yeah, these are just, th 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 this is. The flows can be seen in some part of the dimension. I mean, so then it doesn't matter. Like all that matters is that you can draw a blue line. So, so I guess what I'm curious about is it, it, does the dynamics 
is there a dimensionality reduction of the dynamics in any of the senses that we yes that we talk about the, the, there is by assumption here in other words we're saying there are three stable states and the stable states are connected by saddles and the saddles must have one unstable mode and therefore n minus one stable modes and but there is, are but for example the the if I think about this, if I literally think about this in terms of the landscape, yeah, um, the curvature in the neighborhood of the stable, or in the neighborhood of the, of the attractors, the curvatures in all directions could be the same. Neighborhood of the attractor, yes, sure, they could and be. So in that sense, if I look at the fluctuations around the attractor, right, there is no, there's no, no dimensionality reduction. Uh, there's no, it's stable. Stable is stable, right? That's but, fixed point. Yes, but. But in particular, if I look at the final relaxation, right, it it tends to come from this side because that's where the mountain path was. Correct. But but it could in particular right. since right. it's not actually right. radiant right. Flow, right. right, right, could do all sorts of things. Right, all sorts of crazy things. Right, right. So in fact, the dynamics need not have the phenomenology. So for example, if the system's being driven by a little bit of noise, and I looked at the covariance basis right. of fluctuation, right, I don't have to see that it's dominated by a single principle. No, 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 not. Not no not at this level no right, correct correct and, so this and, is true without many of the corollaries of uh, the dimensional reduction. Uh, yes, at this level we right you only I mean right at this level we're, 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 this is a, a topological statement we're not saying anything about. Of course, this is a useful I mean in the case of those saddle points. Here. This is a useful way to fit data because the saddle points have stable and unstable directions. So you could ask how stable, you know, how big is the stable direction in the saddle? That becomes useful. And similarly here, of course, you are invited to look at, if you had a model, other directions. But in terms of enumerating the classes, given the assumptions, there's a, and the, the virtue of doing this, this is non-trivial, but it's a finite, relatively short list. And it's really rather, I mean, again, this is obviously more, more random than me, but for example, you see this picture must have a flip bifurcation running down the middle. And the flip bifurcation terminates in a saddle node. And this termination is cusp, this one is transverse. And that's because the saddle node in which it is terminating is not is is a saddle node on the source. So so he, here is the flip bifurcation, right? So here is the initial, you know, so the upper state, the red one, either flips down to the blue one or flips down to the orange one. So this so this this on the two sides of the green curve is that flip bifurcation. And when when this thing terminates by the red uh, red fixed point doing a saddle node with the saddle, leaving you with just these two lower things, that's a transverse intersection. When it disappears by one of these target ones doing a saddle node, it's a cusp. That's a theorem, just by fiddling normal forms, to be sure. But there's a lot of structure here, which is you get for free. And this sort of illuminates, okay, fine. So let me show you, so this is not completely abstract, um, at our, one of our exercise in fitting data. So here we have stem cell differentiation from Briscoe's lab in, uh, at, at Crick. And what we have here is uh, mouse embryonic stem cells. He's doing multi-dimensional facts. He has five markers um, uh, and he's, he's, he's faxing his cell population every 12 hours for five days. And he is playing around with wind signaling and FGF signaling. And he is steering these cells into these states. And we were charged, I mean, mostly these younger people were charged with fitting this data in a useful way. So let me, let's, let me just do the movie. Okay, so here is one such experiment. Here, here's, here's the model fit to a lots of data, you know, multiple times, multiple morphogens, multiple, multiple that. Fit, fitting one such experiment. So the cells will start here in the epiblast state and we apply, whoops, this should, this should, shit. I was just wrong, damn it.
Okay, let me escape. Oy. Okay, that is regrettable. Okay. Um, this will now run. It's a little bit low resolution, but this should now run. Okay, fine. So the cells fall out of the epiblast state, go to the caudal epiblast state, topography changes, they do a flip bifurcation and they end up in either posterior neural or meso, mesoderm. So that is an example of fitting a, um, so now I could go back to play. I don't know why the damn thing didn't run. Um, uh, I flip controls, I could play, I could go back. So, um, so again, just to recapitulate, uh, you classify your cells by the fax data into one of these five states. You look at the populations, the numbers of cells in those five states as a function of time in these various morphogen histories. There are a few transitioning cells, which you fit in the model also. And then you simply show the dynamics of the experiment are fit by the dynamics of this topography. Good reason to think that there's another when you go around the fold, there's only broken the smooth part, so to speak. Yeah. There's good reason to think that the reprogramming dynamics are around that part because if you're trying to go back up through all your saddles, yeah. The, 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 you're trying to go, as you said, the saddles are five dimensional with one and with one, yeah, right. and then four, and then there's this right. S. Going back through that, is a real headwall, right? Because you yeah. take really the right steps, right, right direction. So maybe, I guess I'm asking, right? Do you have a system where you can reprogram and ask these? Questions? Um, that is, we're very close to having, with the this mouse um, inner cell mass to epiblast, yeah. and um, primitive endoderm. You know, there people have done the reprogram. In fact, Cat has, who you know, uh, has done the reprogramming by forcing expression of transcription factors. And it's easy one way, hard the other way. In fact, you can do it one, one way with morphogens. It's, it's hard, very hard the other way to do with fat factors. It's very unclear why. It's also very unclear why you can't stabilize the intermediate state, which people would love to do. So it's an interesting system for which I think these are the appropriate mathematical tools to try to dissect it. But again, as, as Madhav was alluding, you want to do the experiment with the model in mind, not as an afterthought. Page. The raw data are in five oh, dimensions. Yes. Oh, this thing rants. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I can, by looking near the end, I can I can I can cluster the late stages. Yes. And find my five pixels. And you could cluster the intermediate. These are these the you know the the, the, the caudal epiblast is an intermediate state which dies away as a function of time. Because it's it, it, it's you know it's it's on the pathway. It's not an endpoint. Of, of course, these endpoints are fictitious endpoints. You know, mesoderm is becomes in the embryo infinitely ramified. We're we're just not seeing that infinite ramification. So it's it's a valley. I guess I'm, I in trying to understand how how you actually deal with the data. You have five dimensional data. You're showing it to us in two dimensions. Right. This is the model. Right. So so so, so so the five dimensional data is pigeonholed into one of five states. Mm -hmm. And you have to, we have to show you that, that that's a good pigeonhole, which it is, but you have, to, you have to see that. And then given those five states, we then ask for their population as a function, the occupancy as a function of time and morphogen history. And then we reproduce that occupancy as a function. So it's a five dimensional vector of occupancy, of, of state occupancy as a function of time and morphogen history. And that is fit to this geometric model. But, but there's one key thing. At the end, there's three states and you're playing with two morphogens. That's why your dimensionality is two because the signaling, the FGF and the Chiron or whatever, uh, called, right, Larry, that's why uh, this is legit. So uh, we have this embedded in two. Um, that's the tilt. Uh, the, the, yes, but we don't, we're not, that is the, tilt, but the way this is getting fit is, uh, so 
the, the, the previous stuff I showed you was um, models that had three stable states. So we are getting these five states by basically gluing together three plus three with one in common. Within each one, I agree with you, the parameter space is two dimensional because there are two morphogens. And of course, if there were three, we'd have to worry about three parameters. There are two. Again, the fact that the parameter space is two dimensional. Sorry, I guess I don't. Th this is the morphogen space. Wait, wait, it, 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 there, there's, there are two types of morphogens, FGF and Wnt. They have various levels, which is a number, right. and they're applied at various times. So it's a big. I guess what I'm wondering about is where is it generically true that systems with five uh, right points can be can be described in two dimensions? Uh, what, okay, so so the the. Um, back to my question. Very good. No, very, no, it's, it's, it, 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 it is a very good question for which there is, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a good biological question for which this is, okay, so let's just stop here. Um, there, here are the five states, right? And we're describing them as these three and then these three. Now, you cannot do a transition from meso to anterior neural. So these, so basically, the, these two sets of three okay. communicate via quarter epiblast. Uh -huh. But so you know, so really, it's the, this is the same statement as if I have three states, I can always just have twice. Yes. Twice. Yes. And and somehow somewhere in the middle of this, those planes, the right. plane got the metric precisely, gets, precisely, the right. Something funny in between, but I don't care. That's you don't fine. care, right? You don't care. That's the deal, and it's not obvious that the atom, so to speak, is three states. I mean, that's sort of progenitor two states, but that's biological folklore. I mean, it, there could be progenitor in, four st in, in three states, or as, as we considered in parallel. Fortunately, this, I mean, there's data which says you can't flip backwards and you can't flip from these to these back here, but that's data. How did you know you needed five dimensions in the past? Uh, that, that no, you, that, 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 that is knowing your genes and, your and choosing the right system. And of course, you should do this with, with higher dimension. But of course, it's either, it's either five or, or 10,000, and there's not much in between, which is unfortunate. You'd like to have maybe 10, but you can't do 10. You have, it's either five or, anyways. So that's okay. So, so let me um, go to uh, conclusions here. Oh, let me say, I, I will say one other thing, which I will beg your indulgence for. Um, I have been rather, um, neglectful of the effects of mechanics and um, uh, morphogenesis. Uh, I want to call your attention to this paper from the Gross uh, Corson group, um, which is in bioarchive now, uh, which looks at gastrulation in chick, which is a big you know, two millimeter size embryo, which is going to make its streak, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the question has long been how you simply get one streak. Uh, you know, how, how does the streak here in the appropriate posterior prevent another streak from happening in the what is the anterior? And of course, it's hard to imagine a chemical signal going fast across a two millimeter size thing and inhibiting that as it might well do in a mouse, for example. Anyway, so these people, this, these people have with experiment, targeted experiment and interesting theory, have shown that if you um, write, that there's good evidence that the, the um, contractile state of the cells is bistable. And if you do that, and also then use the fact that of course, tension will propagate very rapidly, very far, you could basically make this mechanical system behave like a Turing system, i.e. there's local activation, long range inhibition, therefore you get one center. That I believe is a very potent remark and has rather good experimental support here and is something that I think will be a paradigm for other systems. And I should remark uh, that um, it is not what is done in this related paper submitted about the same time uh, by uh, Mara's former mentor, which has a similar sounding name, but a rather different model, which does not have this Turing-like uh, effect in it mechanically. Okay, so to conclude, uh, you know, genetics gave us the park, 
the parts list, but it did not give us a very good view on how to put the parts together. And of course, if you take it, you know, if you if you think of dynamics as only reporting the endpoint of develop uh, endpoint of a screen, it's a very hard way to to infer dynamics by simply looking at the endpoint state. Uh, stem cell systems are a very good way to look at these pathways. Uh, the, the canalization is your license to look at things phenomenologically and by by do, by levels by by uh, the size of you know, by sort of by uh, hierarchy of, of decisions. Uh, mathematics gives you a list, a short list of dynamical models. But the most important uh, point to be made um, is that the dynamics you want, that the data you want to collect to understand these dynamical models is very much dynamic, and it has to be around the time that the dynamics is sensing these saddles is changing from state A to state B uh, dynamically. And even though the biologists cannot look at their experiment and, and, and intuit what the model is, it's, one has to make those measurements with the model in mind, fit the model. And that is then the proper, the minimal, uh, not incorrect representation of the dynamics for the development. And that's perhaps the most important remark to leave behind is that you want to do dynamic experiments and do them as the first speaker indeed already said, you want to have the uh, model in figure one, not figure seven. As, and that's rather important because it has to be, that things have to go in parallel. So with that, I stop and uh, we'll take any other questions. I messed up. So, Maybe people in the audience have questions or people sitting around the table have questions? Or just generally exhausted. Yes. yes. I'm going to have to answer a philosophical question. In the medical community, in the end, they're still totally obsessed with genetics because they're obsessed with making drugs, right? So the sort of like molecules of the label, we yeah. know how to intervene. And so if we don't have a molecular description, how do we use a description to right. fix it? So I guess the question is uh, is one of how do we use a description like this? So it's conceptually helpful, right? As we think about how development works. Um, is it application helpful? Okay, also? good. But I have a very good story for you. Uh, I was once upon a time a foot soldier in the war on cancer. <laughs> uh, and I was going to, the, to this effort by Arnie Levine. And uh, we were operating on the uh, breast cancer melanoma front. And the field marshals involved were. Um, You're um, going to hold on to this for the whole time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're going to keep it going. Okay, it's not the military. And, and <laughs> with the military end. And the uh, <laughs> uh, generals involved were Jose Vizelga and MSK and Levi Garraway, who's in your place, both of whom have left academic science. For different reasons. Um, uh, Garroway went to a drug company and Baselga was disgraced by financial proprieties. Um, so the goal was to do dwarf screens. So, so they, they were looking at it basically it's, it's, it's a phosphorylation cascade cascade with ERK and all these all that all, all, all that uh, AK18, all that other stuff, right? And what they wanted to measure was they had a, one of the guys had a screen for um, cell death, which was, you didn't have to wait for two days, you could wait for 12 hours and infer what was gonna happen two days later, which was useful. And therefore what they wanted to tell us was, you, you fiddle this or that gene, you measure cell death, what's happening in the phosphorylation cascade? That's what they wanted to know. And that's because though that's the experiments they did, they knew and loved. They put together a consortium of people who did this and did that. They, they sort of made a pipeline. And they wanted to know what's going on in the phosphorylation cloud. Why, why how does that help? And, and, then to, and then you will know how to intervene with drugs? Yeah, yeah they, they, want, they want to know what, what drugs prevented, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. resulted in cell death or not cell death. Mm -hmm. And the things they were, the drugs they were hitting were these phosphatases and kinases mm -hmm. up here. Mm -hmm. And they wanted us to tell them, based on cell death, what was happening up here. And I told them this was not the useful experiment. 
And they, of course, wouldn't listen because what do I know about cancer? So I deserted, deserted. the field of battle and, and left. left. And, and they, they did something about it. But like I said, the, the two chiefs left academic science and are you know, no doubt trying to make drugs. So that's a case where the experiment you want is, for example, a Cytoff experiment where you could look at you know, this, this thing where you, you, you put uh, uh, heavy atoms on various antibodies. You can measure 25 phosphoproteins. It's a wonderful technology. And you could do that. And you could tell me what this phospho cascade cloud is. That would, that would give me a model. And that's a very useful model to make to know where you intervene with what effect, because you know, things go up, things go down. There's all sorts of feedbacks, feed forwards. I mean, God knows how to sort that out without some data which looks at those molecules. So I think that's a very practical way to do things. And of course, uh, the illustrious people at Sloan Cutting wouldn't wouldn't listen to the likes of me. This is just not about that. This is this is this is very much about this pertains to this cancer study as much as it does to development because it says that you want to make measurements that sort of trivial remark that you want to make measurements that pertain to the dynamical decisions which are upstream of your death or birth. Got it. Got which it. which okay. which is where the op which is where the so called decision is happening. I see. So instead of tracking the type of state that you're tracking here, you would track molecular states. Yeah, you, you, you would, I, you would tell me, you know, who, who is phosphorylated, who is not phosphorylated, yeah. downstream from the other side, which is sort of an obvious thing to do. But they, they had their machine, and they were going to grind forward on the Eastern Front with their machine, hell or high water. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I deserted. <laughs> And God knows what they ended up doing. Like I say, they uh, the, the field marshals also deserted. Um, so I, I don't know what happened. You know, we we still get people still get breast cancer, so they haven't solved it. But that's precisely a case where um, you you want to make the measurement where the decision, which is not a profound remark, but it's not what they do. They're very much. I mean, you know, my immunology friends tell me their favorite assay is feet up, feet down. Right, the mouse is dead or a mouse is alive. That's the assay. It's an easy assay to score, but it's very hard to infer the dynamics of a germinal center based on feet up or feet down. So the remark is, so I, I make this remark at Rockefeller, that's why I'm generally marginalized, but anyway. Is it, is there anything in the mathematics that tells you that, well, I'm in some high dimensional space, but I know there's a limited number of fixed points. Right. So that, me so that means that there are certain senses in which the dimensionality is lower. Correct. Sort of so trivial that, senses, relatively trivial senses. Well, yeah, but, right, well, I guess maybe limited but rigorous would be yeah, good right. because, right, the, the sense is, 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 is not all encompassing. But it's really true, as opposed to right. Some of the other things people say about the right. So, uh, does that in any way go along with the idea that if I'm in this high dimensional, if the dynamics are, if, are in this very large dimensional space, that somehow if I look at some randomly chosen projection or at a limited number of axes, that unless I'm very unlucky in the generic case, I'll somehow capture the yeah, yeah, right. These the, these are. I mean, we, our list is, we believe, a complete list unless we screw it up. So any cut in any two-dimensional slice will should cut one of our. You, you you may not see the whole thing, right? I mean, you know, you may, um, right? I mean, he, here we have this picture. I mean, maybe you're only looking down here. Maybe you're only looking up here. But these things have to end. I mean, you know, if if you have if you have a third state. There's a, li there's a finite list of these pictures of these parameter spaces. And of course, your, your, your actual parameters may just be living down here. You don't see this. But, but again, so in terms of fitting data, if you have something you know, like these, uh, these developmental things, whichever, whichever it is, I guess it's back, it's further back. Um, 
you know, this is a really a minimal model. This is as minimal as it gets without losing the topology of these flows. So this is as minimal as it gets. So it certainly behooves you to do this and not 25 genes. And it also, these are also an excuse to, to ask if you fit data, can you fit data to a model with one unstable direction and lots of stable ones? And your know, model was the case in for RNA, single cell RNA seq, where you, you could actually see the one unstable direction. And then you could ask, you know, how stable are the other one? But that, that's a numerical thing. But at least you have a fun, or it, I think the best case is this uh, starburst, wherever that was. Uh, oh, shit. Um, uh, okay, this thing, right? I mean, here, it's a very precise description. You have a saddle with five unstable directions, which then terminate in other saddles with three unstable directions. And you could fit your data. I mean, we, we have mathematically taken this minimal model and added stuff to it that adds stable directions. It retains the essential fixed point with its five unstable directions. And then you could fit that and say, well, how stable is stable? But it's a very precise functional form in which to fit data. And it's, it's as minimal as it can get without losing something in the sort of the Einsteinian sense. Minimal as it can be without being wrong, without being manifestly wrong. But it's a way of fitting, you know, asking, you know, how, and you know, maybe all the eigenvalues are roughly the same, in which case you haven't done anything, but at least you have something to fit to and say that. So th this I found illuminating, because it's just so simple and it, and it explains this to a surprising degree. And again, it, you also get into the issue of what's the metric and how much metric do you need in this and that. And in fact, it's, 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 it's all in this paper, um, but it's uh, useful. It was for me a, a instructive example. Yeah. Okay, well, in that case, let's thank Eric again and all of our speakers and the, um, the uh, hearty group that stayed till the end of the day. Um, and we'll have a virtual drink. Yes, yes, we should go off and uh, enjoy ourselves. And um, the it is, the plan is to post the talk, so you can tell your friends that if you in, enjoyed this and they missed it, um, they can they can at least uh, watch the recording. And um, I guess this is our final event for the semester, so we will see what we're doing next semester. Maybe with a little bit of luck, um, we'll be able to see more of you in person. And so thank you all. <laughs>